Hi, Natalie. Can you hear me? Hi, Natalie, can you hear me?
So, so, so. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning, wherever it is. Review the agenda and uh, we'll move forward. The AMB Academy, Academy is the co coordinator be, with Nano Centrics, Electronics, James, and Nano We started the Academy in order to educate the industry about additive manufacturing. The challenges we were bringing up today is starting with the solutions to become available. The, the agenda for today, we will start, start with uh, Dr. Yang from the University of Technology in Sydney, who is going to talk about RF uh, devices and applications by AME. Then we'll have a presentation by Rob Hendricks from the Hall Center on 3D printed microelectronics. Then Emil Joliet from a Yol Development will talk about the AME direction, the technologies required, the roadmap. Uh, Oliver Raffle and Chris Bailey from the Frankfurt IPA will talk about. We'll talk about the aspects of um, 
<coughs> of and the next factory work that they have done in additive manufacturing. And then okay. uh, uh, Andrea Solomon and Rolf will talk about, uh, from James, they will talk about the advanced about applications the advanced. of AME technology, quite an interesting thing that we'll see there. And then I will wrap up from nano dimensions about device, device design, and the manufacturing capabilities. So with so this, this, I would like to turn over to Dr. Yang, who is going to give us a presentation on millimeter wave devices, design and performance from 200 gigahertz, gigahertz fabricated by the technology. Dr. Yang. Yeah. Thank you uh, for attending this uh, um, academy here, and I'm very glad to have the opportunity to um, share my research, uh, recent research progress uh, with you. And um, thank you for, for, for introducing me. And uh, Today's topic is about AME microwave devices design and performance from 1 gigahertz to 100. Um, uh, device level design. So, um, yeah, if uh, any uh, any any time in the future, if you have a, if you interested, have a chance to come to Australia, feel free to come to my lab to have a look of the. Um, So um, today's talk will pretty much cover six sections. That uh, for for the um, um for people from both another dimension and the UTS, right? Um, right overview. So um, the future of high speed RF electronic devices gonna be um uh, highly expected in the some um device level designs, especially in packages. Right, so the package for the package circuit and the uh, antenna device, we accept uh, the device can have a high performance similar to the um, uh, to what uh, you can achieve in the traditional fabrication way, and we want the um, device level electronics to be low cost, multifunctional, and compact. Most importantly, uh, has has to be low power and application driven. Um, so for this kind of uh, devices. Um, we can look at some of the um, application scenarios uh, we uh, they um, already been um, introduced in the open literature. For example, at uh, our future uh, wireless communication environment could be looking like this on the in the uh, figure showing here that uh, people might bring the uh, portable devices like smartphone and uh, walk around, and so the um, smart devices can easily. Uh, talk to each other, and uh, while you uh, walk on the street or pass through some um, dif uh, different application, uh, different living um, uh, scenarios. So uh, the next generation of wireless devices is supposed to be really high performance, and we. Uh, so if we look at the device level, uh, the the packages and packaged antennas or circuits should be looking like this, like showing in this uh, figure in the middle. So uh, that means for the um, circuit design has to be really, really um, uh, a packaged uh, and with a very small compact low profile and uh, very demanding. So the antenna is supposed to be in, uh, integrated into the um, uh, 
into a very low profile process. For example, this device uh, that um, um, introduced by IBM a few years ago. And um, the, that means the, um, we have to really consider the um, chip level integration between the package antenna and the, the um, um, electronic devices. So, um, however, the current uh, um, process like uh, the LTCC or um, glass or organic polymer devices, uh, they are not, are not cheap. So um, we have to uh, look at some alternative way to fabricate um, low cost and um, high performance electronic devices, especially packaged in the, um, uh, for the um, small portable devices, right? So that means cost will be the one of the important thing we have to think about. So uh, let's quickly have some of the state of the art antenna package designs for, for some commercial products. For example, this uh, uh, Motorola mobile handset. Uh, it has the antenna um, on chip module at um, which is uh, the uh, Qualcomm QTM052 that uh, um, embedded into the handset on the two sides and of the hand uh, uh, of the handset, and um, really depend which model it is. So the antenna in package could be um, uh, integrated into the different section of the mobile phone. So um, the module itself looked like this by 19, 19, uh, 19 by 4.8 um, millimeter square millimeter. So if you look at the profile, it's very uh, it's not very thick. And the antenna is right on the bottom of the PCB board. So um, if you look at the X ray scanned photo here, so uh, they are pretty cool. So that means everything is supposed to be um, highly integrated into a very small module. That. And um, um, let's have a look at some other um, products by Qualcomm. Uh, we can see that they're very small, compact, with low profile. So they operate on the millimeter wave band, um, which is the uh, 5G, uh, the, um, the, the current 5G frequencies. So um, later last year, um, uh, University of Michigan, they introduced the first, uh, uh, world's, world's first uh, 16 antenna beam former array in package that uh, was released in November last year. So um, we can see uh, the antenna can be, uh, antenna in package can be properly um, in, uh, interconnected with a chip that um, to um, for the antenna module, and uh, so this is a very compact device as well. So um, now we have the question: Why we need AME, and how AME can contribute to the uh, next generation uh, electronic devices? So the AME devices they have the apparent advantages of. Um, 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 in terms of fabrication, it's fast prototyping, which means we can do everything in-house and uh, the machine can run 24 seven. And uh, we don't need to worry too much about uh, the logistics, um, the, uh, the cost of the logistics. And um, so the, and another important thing is low entry cost because um, um, you don't need to worry too much about the, uh, the first prototype you're building. And uh, so you just need to, um, uh, you can quickly prototype it with the, uh, acceptable, acceptable uh, cost, right, for proof, uh, for proof of concept. So uh, some other um, distinguished uh, uh, features can be summarized here, such as customizable designs, and you have a lot of design flexibilities in 3D. And um, yeah, you can do the conformal shapes that um, with a flexible layout that cannot be done easily by the traditional fabrication method. Um, one important thing here is uh, the single substrate with multiple metal layers. Um, for traditional fabrications, uh, you have to um, uh, stack multiple PCBs together to have the multi-layer antenna or circuit designs. Uh, that requires a lot of um, um, engineering work and um, you might have uh, the challenges to align the layers properly and uh, you need to consider the tolerance and the reliability of each um, um, assembled device, because uh, um, you have to, uh, how reliable this kind of uh, um, multi-layer, multi-PCB layer 
stacking technique is um, is questionable, right? So, um, but if we use AME technique, we can easily um, uh, fabricate the multi layer, multi metal layer structure into a single substrate. That's very um, how that's a very brilliant method that we can um, um, we have that uh, can can be introduced by the AME technology. Um, so let's have a look of um, uh, now we understand why we need AME and uh, how the AME technology can might, might be able to contribute to the antennas and the microwave circuit, right? Right. So um, we want to look at the, the um, design examples and the, the performance of this uh, this a, a, uh, this AME inspired designs. So uh, the first example we want to look at here is just a simple patch antenna that we achieved. Uh, um, at uh, 3.6 gigahertz, which is the uh, uh, 5G sub-6 uh, frequency band. Um, we, met, we fabricated this um, um, antenna prototype uh, using Dragonfly um, at Pro 2020. That's, that's the first version of the Dragonfly. And we can clearly see that the, um, the antenna can be very well prototyped and the surface of the antenna is very smooth. And um, the uh, fabricated antenna with the simulated uh, uh, the the, the fabricated uh, the fabricated antenna can produce the very very good measured re uh, results comparing with simulated ones as shown here. Uh, those are the radiation patterns um, in E plane and H plane for the three point five to three point seven gigahertz um, performance. Um, they're pretty good, which can be used for the wireless communications at the, the sub six key frequency band. So um, other than the single patch layer design, we also investigated the multi-layer antenna performance that uh, by uh, stacking uh, multiple metal layers to, um, to see how, uh, how the antenna might perform. So we interestingly, uh, interestingly we we find these um, multi-metal uh, multi, uh, multi layer patch antennas can, um, can produce really wide uh, operational frequency band. So uh, for example, we compared uh, three, uh, three different designs here, uh, one layer, two layer, and three layers. We find the frequency band can be expanded to um, above 10%. And uh, we also find that if we stack, in, we stack more antenna layers, uh, we can achieve uh, more than 80% of the uh, frequency band as shown in this figure E here. And uh, the bandwidth is uh, 83%. If we, uh, if we stack more uh, antenna layers, we should be able to easily achieve more than 100% antenna bandwidth. Um, and no matter how many uh, little metal layers we applied here, one important thing is that we haven't increased the substrate thickness. This is very important uh, because we can keep the low profile, but we uh, can achieve a very wide frequency and an uh, operational frequency band. Um, so this is uh, just the antenna performance tunability that uh, we can control the is by tuning the physical parameters of the patch antenna. Um, the third prototype we want to uh, introduce here is a linearly polarized uh, antenna array, which is a two by two antenna. Uh, as we can see here, we apply five different layers and um, three layers as a radiation elements, and one layer as a ground, another layer, the fifth layer is the feeding network. So um, uh, as we can see from the performance here, that antenna array can produce a real, realized gain of about 7.7 .7 dBi, that's a measured value, operating at the center frequency of 3.6 gigahertz. And the radiation pattern shown here, which means that it can cover the uh, both side uh, of the radiation direction properly. Um, so other than a linearly polarized antenna, we also have this circularly polarized antenna array here. Similarly, we achieve, we use five layer metal layers to, uh, to achieve this design and um, three layers as a radiation. 
So we use this kind of um, um, chopped square uh, shape to produce a circular polarization, uh, which is a, a typical way that the antenna designs for um, CP um, radiation patterns. Um, so we can see that uh, this uh, two by two array can generate an uh, antenna gain of uh, 7.6 dB dBIC, um, which is a measured value. Um, the uh, actual ratio bandwidth is uh, from 3.45 to 3.68, which is really good uh, for the um, for receiving the circular polarized uh, radiation. Um, the radiation patterns are shown here, which are pretty symmetric. Uh, that is good for the to, to maintain a good uh, radiation performance. So we compared our designs with other state-of-the-art um, patch antenna arrays fabricated in different um, um, addictive manufacturing approach. Uh, we find that uh, the AME technique can produce really low profile as shown in, uh, in this column here, uh, which is uh, only the thickness of this pro prototype is only 0 0.03 or 0 0.04 um, in terms of um, um, uh, lambda G, which is the wave wavelength at that frequency. So um, those are the listed liter. Uh, literature that we uh, compared in the uh, so other than the antennas, we also studied the circuit package. That um, here is one typical example of bandpass filter. So filter is a very important device in the microwave circuits, uh, like microwave system, because it can um, it can um, uh, properly control the signal that you want to um, process in the system and eliminate the unwanted signals in the store band. So um, for this um, filter that we applied the uh, multi, uh, like similar to the previous design, applied the five layers to achieve this design. So as shown in, uh, in the left-hand side figure that uh, uh, different color here represent different um, filter layers. So um, this side view here shows that uh, the distance between um, between every two layers. And we can see that we only need like 90 uh, micro uh, uh, distance to, between, uh, to, to realize this very compact um, um, filter design. So that means the profile of the filter is very low. And um, the layer by layer layout are showing here in, in the colors of uh, blue, red, and the uh, dark blue and also yellow. So this photo here shows a fabricated device with the um, testing accessories, which are the uh, SMK connectors, because we measure the frequency up to 40 gigahertz to, to show the pass band and the, and the stop band performance. So um, that's how we look of the performance of this filter. So this filter is very compact, like I mentioned before, which is one um, distinguished uh, feature of a, uh, AME fabricated device. So the size is only 2.7 by 1.4 by 0 .4, approximately 0 0.5 um, cubic, uh, cubic millimeter. Uh, yeah, the, in terms of uh, lambda G is 0 0.18 by 0 0.9098 uh, by 0 0.4. So, sorry, Yanki, yeah, can you start yes. just of this fabricated microwave bandpass filter. So they, uh, as we can see from this figure that uh, the, um, um, the fabricated filter is very, very compact. It's only about uh, uh, 0 0.186 by 0 0.09, uh, 0 0.098 by 0 0.04 uh, lambda G, which is a, a, a wavelength of, the, um, of that uh, operational frequency. So the uh, center frequency of this device is 12.25, and uh, which has a bandwidth of uh, uh, around 9.5 to 14.5 gigahertz. The insertion loss is about minus three, and, um, and, the, and, and the auto band suppression is minus, uh, is from 16, approximately from 16 to 
uh, 40 gigahertz um, with a 20 dB um, signal suppression level. And um, so the figure on the right hand side shows a measured as per meters, and we, should, we can see that the measurement and simulation results are pretty close. Uh, indicate that uh, the AME, AME technology is pretty reliable in terms of design. Um, so other than the future design example, we also want to introduce the uh, pencil beam lens antenna that we achieved recently. So the design concept of this uh, device is, uh, um, is a, a free nail lens. So uh, rather than a traditional freezer lens, which is operating at a single band, we actually um, play with the direction of the grids of the frenal lens and uh, combine two, uh, two grids into the one um, by vertically uh, stacking them together. As we're showing in this concept here, the yellow color is one lens, the blue color is a second lens. But if you can, uh, we vertically stack them together, we get the dual band um, uh, free, uh, free nail zoom uh, plate lens. So the different colors here, regional region, um, uh, sorry, different region of the lens. So region one here is opaque for the two bands, which are full metal. That means the signal cannot propagate through it, uh, which is um, uh, the principle of, um, of the uh, uh, free nail lens. So the second region, region two here, uh, represented by the yellow color, uh, is opaque for the higher band. And um, however, it's not opaque for the lower band. Um, similarly, uh, region three represents opaque for the lower band, um, which only represented by the grid A, the in blue color. So um, for the region four, which is a transparent, uh, or the white color actually for the two bands as shown in the um, third, um, third figure here, um, that allows, um, uh, that's, that's, um, that doesn't, um, and that's neither the grid A nor the grid B exist. So um, that means we can, uh, by using the AME technique, we can actually achieve dual band and uh, free new uh, free new zoom plate uh, lens designs into a single device. So this is how we uh, achieve the multi uh, level multi layer designs by using the AME. Simply, we just uh, vertically integrate those two lenses together to form the final prototype. And the different uh, regions are clearly mentioned here to form the two different um, lens lenses. Um, so uh, for the uh, operations at the uh, high band, the 120 gigahertz, uh, we can see that um, um, the high band uh, electromagnetic wave can transmit through the region three and region four. However, they will be reflected at the region one and two. And um, similarly, um, at the lower band, uh, one is operating at a four, a 75 gigahertz, the lower band electromagnetic wave can transmit through the region two and four. However, the region one, uh, however, those signals can well be reflected back by other region one and three. Uh, this is why we can have the two a dual band performance by, um, even though that we only have uh, um, uh, uh, one prototype there. So this is a, the, uh, a very distinguished, uh, distinguished feature of the AME technique that we allow us to integrate multiple devices into one, which means all uh, two-in-one function here. Um, so this is a fabricated uh, prototype. Uh, we can see that um, it's very, uh, the prototype is, uh, looks very nice and uh, the surface are very smooth, uh, well finished. Um, the, when we do the measurement, we put the lens antenna um, in the middle of the testing system. We call it antenna and the test, or device and the test. So uh, we generate the signal from a signal generator at millimeter wave band, either to 120 or 75 gigahertz. So the signal will be uh, up converted to the required frequency and so the waveguide WR, WR07 or WR12. The device, the device will be excited by the home antenna here. 
So we have the receiving antenna rotating in the other side of the lens to receive the signal at the far field. Um, the signal will be received by the signal analyzer and displayed on the spectral uh, analyzer to, to, to see the amplitude of the uh, received signal. So those are the measured radiation patterns at 120 and 75 gigahertz respectively. And the, antenna, uh, the lens uh, antenna again are shown on the figure here as well. We can see that um, uh, without the lens, the source, the gain of the source, which is a home, is only uh, around 7 dBi, 7 to 8. Uh, with a lens applied, we can achieve a very high gain. Uh, the measured one would be uh, around 19 dBi uh, in the 75 uh, uh, frequency band. Um, at the 120 gigahertz band, the uh, source gain is around uh, uh, is around 8 dBi. However, the uh, the measured antenna gain can be above 20 dBi, which is which is really high. Um, this is a measurement. Far, uh, this is a far field measurement scenario that uh, we, uh, we we did in our lab at UTS. Um, so, other than the prototype we introduced of the lens antenna, we also achieved the, another dual beam meter surface antennas, uh, which again, which is also very impressive and. Uh, because we didn't thought we could achieve this kind of design by using multi-level AME techniques. Uh, however, when we achieved this design, we think, oh, this is fantastic. We didn't thought that that's possible. Let's have a look uh, of the performance here. So um, before we uh, look at the performance, I would like a quick, I would, I would like quickly uh, to show the uh, how we design, uh, how we uh, come up with design concept. So, Meter surface, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, is actually a surface that contains a, a, a large array that to, to, to be able to manipulate the electromagnetic waves at the operational frequency band. So for this design, we propose a, a new unit cell that have, is composed of multi-metal layers. And for this design, we for each unit cell, we have the top and bottom metal layers functioning as the receiving and the transmitting antennas respectively. That means when the receiving antenna receives a signal, you will be the electromagnetic waves will be uh, converted to the um, electric signal propagated to the uh, conductors as shown here, um, vertically stacked. So the transmitting antenna is able to transmit the signal at the end on the other side of the meter surface, uh, so that this this is kind of a transmitter array. Um, um, if we look at the fabricated um, prototype, so um, we actually have a, a, a large array that formed by this kind of unit cells. They have different orientations to achieve the different phase this, uh, phase shift for each um, uh, each pixel. So those are the backside. As these are this is a backside of this transmitter array and um, the middle one is the top side. So they look very um, different to the traditional, uh, the, the meter surface part fabricated by the traditional way, uh, which are often um, achieved by uh, two metal layers using the uh, Rogers PCB or uh, FR4 PCB. So um, the performance of this um, meter surface antenna can be seen from here. So we, like I mentioned the, in the uh, in the title here, this is a dual beam circular polarized um, in the surface. So um, we have a, we can generate a, a collimated and or the vertex beams by using this concept. So the first prototype we achieved here is a, a collimated beam that. Uh, you can see from this um, uh, figure, we can produce two beams, one with um, um, plus 15 degrees uh, beam shift, another has minus, minus 15 degrees beam shift. 
um, they are pointing to different propagation, uh, different directions for um, communications. So uh, if we look at the, the electric field that uh, uh, we are showing here, the left-hand circular polarized beam actually is, uh, is reflected to the um, minus uh, the, the plus 15 degrees. And on the right-hand side, this is a right-hand circular polarized beam. We can see clearly the propagation directions being changed. Um, other than the um, um, collimated beams, we also have the vortex beams generated by this meter surface. So vortex beam, like my, like we can understand from the, um, the main, it's actually kind of um, um, beam has that the vortex feature. Um, but if uh, we look at this middle figure here, uh, those are the dual beams we produce by this meter surface. Um, they, again, they, uh, they are different, they have different polarizations. One is left hand, left hand side circular polarization, another is the right hand side um, circular polarization. So the left one, uh, LHCP actually has minus a, a positive, a plus 15 degrees um, beam shift. The uh, RHCP has minus 15 um, degrees fifth, uh, beam shift. So uh, these, these are the, um, uh, uh, electric field distribution of this um, uh, of the dual beams that uh, we cut um, at the X O Y plane. So uh, the corner figure here shows actually the phase di distributions of the of the two beams, uh, which can uh, which uh, verifies that they are actually corresponding to the left hand side and the right hand. And circular polarized beams. So um, this is the fabrication process of this um, um, device that I, I'm sure uh, I'm already introduced. And then, so uh, the right uh, right hand side figure here shows how we measure those kind of meter surface. We just use um, the uh, um, transmitting antenna here, which is whole antenna and to fit this meter surface. And on the receiving side, we, we use a home antenna to receive a signal. We use a uh, network analyzer to, uh, to, um, to synchronize the transmitting and the receiving signal to uh, work out the um, polarization of the, um, uh, of the uh, received signal. Um, yeah, so um, conclusion. It's my um, pleasure that I uh, have this chance to share the recent progress that uh, we achieved at uh, uh, the University of Technology Sydney together with um, support from Nano Dimension. And uh, we have uh, demonstrated that uh, the AME solution is uh, has a lot of advantage, especially for some customizable high performance uh, radio frequency or microwave device designs. Um, there are a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of the design flexibilities. And we demonstrate that uh, the designs can be from a few gigahertz to about 100 gigahertz. Um, uh, one distinguished feature here is uh, the AME's uh, multi-layer uh, design capability that uh, we can do both linear polarized or circular polarized antenna arrays for not only uh, the 5G's uh, sub-6 gigahertz frequency band, millimeter wave band, and also may be used for the potential future 6G applications, which is uh, about 100 gigahertz. So AME um, provides the possibility of uh, circuit miniaturization. Uh, we already demonstrated that. We uh, can achieve very low profile design with uh, uh, very compact um, um, dimensions. So um, apparently um, the AME can bridge the gap between PCB and the semiconductor chips, uh, which we have already been working on. Uh, recently, we have one paper published, on, um, uh, sorry, accepted by the um, International Conference of Solid State Circuit uh, with a collaboration with uh, MIT and the Tsinghua University. Uh, we will introduce that design in our next uh, seminar. 
So please uh, just um, keep um, keep an eye on our progress here. So uh, this is my contact. If you have any inquiry about the designs and the, the uh, performance of those uh, demonstrated prototypes, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much for your time today. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yang. Any questions? Okay, I have some questions from the audience online. <clears throat> the question came from a, from Hong Kong. The, the question is uh, on the patch uh, design, on the antenna design, uh, can you create the uh, change electronically the emission spectrum or aspects uh, by biasing the different layers? Uh, I think, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Norman, for the, um, uh, for introducing this question. Uh, yes, it's possible. We are currently working on the um, um, active designs by introducing the biasing uh, for different, um, uh, different design prototypes. So uh, it's likely to achieve the tunable performance by using um, active devices. This is our uh, current uh, working task. Yes, it is possible. Okay, thank you. And then the last, we'll ask one more question. There are two more, but we'll uh, answer those uh, separate. Uh, for the, ban the bandpass filter, have you integrated that with a full circuit or plan to do that? That's in plan at the moment. So if you, uh, as I introduced in the slide that uh, the bandpass filter uh, can show a good uh, in-band, out-of-band performance. So uh, um, yeah, it's possible to be integrated with a, a system our front end. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yang, and uh, we'd like to thank you for your participation at this uh, time of the day over there in Australia. And uh, we're going to move to the next speaker, um, Dr. Rob Hendricks from the Hall Center. Uh, we'll come to talk to us about 3D additive li lithography for electronics. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, yeah, so, uh, sorry, is it on? Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be talking about uh, uh, 3D additively um, uh, lithography for electronics. Um, first, uh, about Whole Center. So Whole Center is an independent R&D institute based in the Netherlands, and it's uh, founded by IMAC and, and TNO. Um, and we're located at the high tech campus in, in Eindhoven. We have two um, research topics we are looking at and expertise groups, and that's uh, hybrid printed electronics and thin film technology. Uh, and on the hybrid printed electronics, we look at uh, in mold electronics, wearable electronics, uh, large area sensor mats, uh, 3D uh, printed microelectronics, high resolution printing, and also uh, mass transfer of, of very small microchips by using uh, uh, lasers. On the other side, we have also lithography processing to thin film technology, uh, where we look at spatial ALD, flexible X-ray detectors, ultrasound applications, um, infrared imagers, organ chips, and also 3D batteries. So today we'll look at the 3D printed uh, electronics topic. So we have a, a long, uh, a lot of years of experience in, in 3D printed electronics. Um, and in the past, we've shown you can integrate electronics, uh, waveguides, microfluidics, and antenna all in one package. Um, and of course, this brings a lot of new opportunities in, in terms of freedom uh, of design. Um, going to the next slide, um, we realized that if you do 3D print electronics, it's, it's ideal for prototyping. Uh, you have a lot of uh, freedom in form. form form factor and it's very cost effective, especially at low uh, throughput. Um, on the other side, you have the subtractive uh, technology, which is uh, basically the uh, PCB manufacturing and the uh, package chips. So you have a high throughput, you have uh, high resolution and high performance. However, it's expensive at low volumes um, and you have a lot of material waste and you have limitation in design freedom. So where we want to move is kind of in between. We want to move to 3D additive lithography, where we target to have mainstream products. We want to have a high electronics 
content so a lot of uh, electronic um, components in a small space and we want to do heterogeneous packaging however what we want to do in order to get to mainstream you have to increase the throughput the resolution and the performance of these devices and this is what we're trying to do with our new uh, printing technology So if you compare the, uh, the printing technology, so you have the conductive tracks and you have the uh, structural part, there are uh, several options you, know, you can choose from. Uh, but what you see is that uh, with, with these combinations, every time it comes back that the main limitation is the throughput. So if you want to go to mainstream, you have to scale, scale things up. So uh, if you choose the inkjet, inkjet combination, so polymer inkjet with conductive inks, the limitation will lie at the um, curing of the conductive inks. So that's mainly solvent and you have to evaporate all that solvent. So you have to do a lot of uh, printing steps in order to, uh, and curing steps in order to uh, create a thick conductive line. Then if you have the dispensing technology, uh, your limitation will be using only one nozzle, a single nozzle. So you have to draw your uh, your line and then the, the the printing speed is the limitation um, then you also have the uh, electroplating technology the lds technology which is uh, great for putting conductive tracks in the outside of the part but what if you want to have everything inside of the part you actually need to uh, laser scribe electroplate go back print an, another layer and then go back and forth which limitate limits your your throughput and then at Whole Center, we, we developed this uh, stereotography process, uh, which is basically uh, a resin, UV resin bath, and you pull out your product. And we combined it with, uh, with dispensing technology. And then we saw also there is a limitation because when you pull out this, this uh, uh, 3D part, you have to clean it, you have to cure it, then you have to dispense on it, you have to thermally cure that, the, the, this conductive track. And then you have to go back into the bath and then going back and forth again takes a lot of time. So it took like 50 minutes per layer to, uh, to, to add. And that's for this reason, we, we actually looked into a new technology, combining the stereotography with a filling technology, uh, where we par in parallel fill all groove structures to increase the throughput. And then two pictures, it looks like this. So on the left side, you can see the stereotography plus dispensing. So we printed this white polymer part and then we dispensed the conductive tracks. In the middle, you can see a key event package, which is contacted. And this took quite some, quite some time to, to print. On the right, you can see the new technology where you can see a 50 micron thick silicon chip with 220 interconnects. And this was all filled, these grooves were all filled in parallel and it took about 0.3 seconds to fill these uh, all these tracks. Um, and later you can see that zoomed in, it, these, these tracks are very, very small. So it can go to 20 micron line, lines and, and smaller. The process uh, looks like this. Um, so on the left side, uh, it's the polymeric part printing. And we start actually with a transparent film uh, for UV light. We coat this. Um, with a UV resin, and then we laminate it onto the product. And then when it's laminated on the product, it's the first picture, uh, we illuminate through the foil and we cross-link cure the, the UV resin, leaving the groove structures or the cavities where the chips will, will go in. Then afterwards, we delaminate the, the film, and then partially of the uncured resin will come out of these grooves. Um, which means that you still need to clean these grooves. And for this, we have developed a, a new cleaning system, uh, which can flush out these grooves at about 500 times per second. So it's also a matter of seconds to clean that. And then uh, we've developed a filling system to fill these grooves with uh, highly viscous materials, um, all at about 50 millimeters per second. Then when these are filled, we go to the thermal curing step and instead, instead of using ovens, we use uh, photonic or infrared curing to cure this in the order of uh, 10 to 20 seconds. And then we repeat this step. So all in all, this will take only 30 seconds per one functional uh, layer. And the unique thing about this technology is that we've developed this prototype system to, to work with UV resins that can go up to 100 Pascal seconds and conductive inks 
which can go up to even 10,000 Pascal seconds. Um, I will talk about that uh, later. Um, to give you an idea of how this technology uh, works, here's a small video of the, uh, the lamination curing and delamination process, which takes about eight seconds in, at this time. So you can see there's a foil coming, it's laminated, then illuminated, and then peeled off again. And then there's a new fresh layer coming, it's laminated, then cured and delaminated. So this is just a prototype system, which in the end will go into our main, main system. Um, and you can see this was 800 layer test, uh, a typical Banshee test design. Um, and interestingly, what we also can do is we can also do uh, three-dimensional air cavities with this technology because we can add a film on top every time. So afterwards, uh, when you have printed these groove structures uh, then, and they are, have been cleaned, then you can fill these grooves very nicely with this, uh, this groove filling system. Um, and um, yeah, we can, we can use very high viscosities. And also you can see it's very clean filling and that's because the film, the, the, the transparent film we use, um, it has a very low roughness. It's about 50 nanometers. So the end product is like a mirror finish. So then you can very cleanly fill these, these grooves even down to, uh, as you can see, 20 microns uh, in future even smaller than that. Um, yeah, and, uh, and uh, because we can use these high viscosities, you can increase the loading of the, uh, of the particle loading. So basically you can fill these grooves in one time or even, or maybe two times. So that gives a, a lot of new, op new opportunities for, um, for advanced chip packaging. Um, so instead of uh, using, for, for example, wire bonding, you can actually directly interconnect to the chip. Uh, also because this resolution of uh, sub 20 microns uh, uh, can directly contact these bare light chips. Um, you also have a high freedom of positioning these chips. So you can place them down or you can place them up or maybe even on the side for some, for some chips. So instead of packaging already packaged product, we actually take the thing we want and we package it in an even smaller device. And then we come to the performance and reliability. So this is one of the key things we're actually looking at and why we actually have built this system to, to handle these high viscosity materials. So first for the performance. So um, as I said, you want to fill these grooves in one or two times. So instead of having a lot of solvent, we want as much uh, uh, metal in there as possible. So, and also reduce the polymer content. So usually you have a, an ink, a screen printable ink, which has quite some polymer content to make sure it sticks to the surface. But when you want to fill a groove, it doesn't, it's not that important anymore. So you, want, you can just remove a little bit of the, of the polymer content of the, of the ink, increase the amount of metal particles and decrease the solvent. And then you can increase the performance and, uh, and the throughput. Of course, then you increase the viscosity and that's why we press it in at high, high pressure. Um, the other thing for reliability especially is to make the conductor, these silicon chips or the, uh, the, the components and the structural part to work together. So usually a, a, a polymer has a pretty high thermal expansion coefficient which means, and, and the silicon has a very low one. So when, it, when you put them together, you get a lot of stresses in your, in your package. Um, and that's how, what we want to change uh, with these uh, UV resins. We want to uh, add uh, fillers, just like they do in the molding compound to reduce the CTE and reduce the stresses in this package. And for that reason, we've developed this coating system with a high pressure saw dye system to be able to do that. Um, then we also want to use high temperature resins because in the end, you also want to solder these components onto your circuit board. Um, and for that reason, you want to use the, so high temperature UV resins in combination with fillers. As I said, you can also choose not to fill grooves and that leaves you air cavities or microfluidic uh, channels. Uh, so it's a really a unique uh, technology to do this in a very fast way. Uh, on the left, you can see a 150 micron thick film. 
it, it has uh, 20 micron thick silicon chips in it. And they, the chip is actually uh, supported on four membranes. It's electrically connected, but it's mounted on four membranes. And around this chip, there is actually an air cavity. So even if there is a CTE mismatch, then um, this, this silicon chip will not be uh, undergo any, any stresses or, or strains. And then on the right, you can see uh, we combined conduct conductive tracks with microfluidics. And uh, we actually do uh, have a collaboration with CATC. So it's a chip Integ integration technology center where we look at uh, in innovative packaging solutions uh, for heterogeneous chip packaging, uh, also antenna in package for mill millimeter wave and RF applications, uh, stressless chip packaging for, for example, uh, uh, pressure sensors, optical packages uh, as we use, uh, we, we can use transparent uh, resins and above 400 nanometers. We can also use these, uh, these resins for optical chip packaging and then organ on chip devices where you can apply chips, con conductive tracks and microfluidics. Um, at this, um, at CATC, it's also possible to do reliability testing. So if we have a new material combination, we can put it through thermal cycling and, and check if, uh, if everything works and we can measure during the cycling um, if everything uh, keeps working. Then we can also do thermal and electrical simulation and optimize the package design uh, to get the, the best performance. So these are this is currently these are currently our capabilities. So we have this prototype system, and uh, the pictures you just saw it was all still a lot of manual work because we only started about one and a half years ago uh, developing this new new method. Um, but since uh, a couple of weeks now, we've uh, installed a VisiTech. Uh, system, which is a, a mass lithography tool, which can structure at 10 micron uh, line spacing, fully digital. Uh, and the first building platform building size will be about 34 to 50 uh, square millimeters. And we can build up to 20 layers in this system. Um, mainly the reason because we have to still do it by hand. Next year, we will integrate this uh, foil lamination system. So we can build up to a thousand layers or, or more. Um, and then uh, the whole concept behind this is that it's scalable, right? So you can actually make the foil much larger and the system much larger where you can go to, for example, 300 by 300 uh, square millimeters. And we think that um, because of the scalability that um, at some point it will be cost effective to even compete with current uh, packaging technologies and give more uh, opportunities for um, for designing your chip, right? So you, you have all the op options to put air cavities, uh, microfluidics, conductive tracks, uh, everywhere you want. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is um, we can also use the conductive tracks not only for electric for conducting the uh, electricity. We can also uh, use it to increase the thermal conductivity of the whole package. So it, that's that's another feature we can use. So yeah, I think we, yeah, this is the final slide. So I think we can reduce the cost, scale it up and uh, we can increase the capabilities of this uh, technology. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Any questions? Could you speak up? Okay, sorry. So I was asking uh, eventually at the end of the day, you still need the ICs, the chips, mm -hmm. to put it in your uh, design and to integrate it with your uh, manufacturing. How do you overcome uh, issues in terms of uh, uh, regarding BGA uh, 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 connections and uh, QFN uh, um, with your pads, inner pads? Well, actually, um the interconnect is definitely one one topic we uh, will look into very closely because that's that's where failures can happen um for the bga if there is already like a solar bar or anything 
as maybe in some cases we don't even have to put the solder ball on, on there. Maybe we can directly connect to the chip. Uh, first, we will look at uh, connecting directly to gold contact uh, chips because uh, because it's easier than contacting to to uh, uh, aluminum, for example. But I think we, over time, when the materials develop, hopefully we can also develop materials that can actually contact directly to uh, aluminum contacts. Thanks. So one other question: Do you think in the future it would be possible to do the three D three D printing? all the way with no uh, need for uh, external chips. I mean, can you think of a situation where you actually print the chip with the, with the, with the PCB? You mean printing transistors? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, well, it might, it might be possible. I mean, we, we go now, this, we chose this system to be uh, um, at 10 micron uh, line spacing for compensating for speed and, and resolution. But of course, there are also lithography systems that can go to two microns and smaller, and then you, you may actually use it indeed to have some, uh, some transistors for, I think, uh, like uh, simple applications, yes. Thank you. Yeah. I think there's also, um, um, now we're talking about filling grooves with conductive material, but you can also fill it with basically any material you want, right? So semiconductor materials is also a possibility. There was a question here online from somebody who attended yesterday's session where there was in the introduction a, a, at least one or two slides that talk about electrostatic dispensing or inkjet. Mm -hmm. How do you compare the two technologies? Yours, the one that you presented and the electrostatic inkjet, which have resolution down to one micron. Yeah, so with the electric static one, you, you still, the, 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 deposition, the deposition thickness after curing is still relatively low. And in this case, you can go to aspect ratios of, uh, let's say, between 0.5 and 1. So if you fill all these tracks completely to the top with conductive material, you can go to much higher performances uh, only with one or two passes instead of printing, uh, uh, let's say, 50 times, for example. Okay, so mainly throughput wise. Throughput wise, yeah. Okay. Um... With respect to the, pa the packaging process, at what temperature should it be done? So we want to integrate this whole curing process um, in line and eventually we like to go to copper materials. And the copper materials start to cure at around 180 degrees Celsius to around 250 degrees Celsius. So finding a, um, a, a UV curable resin that can go up to these temperatures and we know the exist that will be very nice. However, if you want to go fast, then you have to heat it up very quickly and cool it down very quickly, which brings a lot of stresses. So getting the CTE, not only for eventually, right, uh, correct, it's already important during the manufacturing to speed up the process. So getting a high temperature UV resin with low CTE is, is, is key for throughput and reliability. And, and for using these, these copper materials. Exactly. So what, what's the total time in, the, in that process for doing a complete package with the vertical integration of ICs as you show? So we, we target 30 seconds per functional layer, which means and conductive track fully cured and, and the chip uh, integrated. And then the thickness of the, the, the layers is 10 to 100 microns, uh, which, we, which we like to tune, right? So we have a saw die system where you can tune the, the thickness. So if you print that 50 micron thickness, then uh, I think in 40 layers, uh, you will have, so it, it, would, it will be minutes to print the whole thing like that with complex packages. Okay, thank yeah. you. Any, que any more questions? Okay, I would like to thank Dr. Hendricks for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you for it. Uh, okay, we want to go to the next speaker. Emil Jolivet from uh, uh, YOL Development, who is going to talk to us about the roadmap directions in AME technology for the electronics industry. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm nice to be here. Thank you, Jen, for the invitation. So you will see in this presentation, there is a nice transition from the one from Dr. Hendricks, because we, we are looking into the direction in additive manufacturing technology for the electronics industry. And I made a focus on the semiconductor packaging. So let me just check. Uh, 
Okay, so just two words on uh, who I am. So uh, I'm Emily Julivet. I'm part of the company named Neol Development. So for those who don't know it yet, uh, we are doing market research and we are specialized on uh, three main, um, let's say, markets. So we are uh, covering semiconductor uh, packaging, memory and computing. But I also have colleagues who have strong knowledge in photonic sensing, power and wireless. Um, and we are doing market technology and strategy consulting. So for the talks today, so I organized it around uh, th three main parts. So the first one, I would like to give you some insights on the advanced packaging business itself on the technology. And then uh, I will make a focus on the added value of the additive manufacturing for advanced packaging applications. And we will see at the end the opportunities and challenges. Uh, a little bit of context of this presentation. So YOL has been covering uh, the additive manufacturing topic for many years. Uh, over the last months, we were given the opportunity to, to do a deep focus on uh, the AM for advanced packaging. So you will see here some results uh, from the technology side. So just uh, to start, um, so as I was saying, we have been covering the, the additive printing for many years. For today, actually, uh, uh, we will focus on functional coating and especially for advanced packaging and substrates. Um, Dr. Hendricks was talking about inks and we will see that for the advanced packaging, the developments that are made on copper are, are very important. Um, so, um, in terms of packaging, uh, over the last years, there was a diversification of the type of package that were used to fulfill the needs of the different de devices that were added to our everyday life. Um, we will see later the importance of the system in package for the device like today, that the smartwatch, but it's even more true for um, the next devices, robot home or holographic interactions that would require at the same time optical devices, silicon-based devices and sensors. In terms of roadmap, uh, advanced packaging became very important over the last years to re not really to replace, but to be a complementary um, technology to the advanced nodes. As you know, more is getting more and more difficult because of the large investment that are needed and the few numbers that are able to fulfill these investments. So even though if we have a very aggressive roadmap of two nanometers by 2025, we know that the advanced packaging will be a relay. And that's the reason why over the last 10 years, there was a diversification of package, but also very aggressive roadmap. So we discussed in the previous presentation on line space. When I look at the line space for um, the most emerging device now, we are around one, one micron. And some of them are also produced at 0 0.4, 0 0.4. And um, advanced packaging is essential to bridge the gap between the silicon dye and the substrate and BCB level. What is true for the substrate um, is true also for all the intermediate interconnects, but we will see that later. In terms of highlights, so I don't know how much you are familiar with the advanced packaging business. 2021 was a kind of record years in terms of spending. You may have heard about Intel and investing 3.5 billion uh, in the US in advanced packaging, but also TSMC, OZAT, Samsung, MCOR, and also players in China. So, so far we have uh, almost top 12 billion investment this year in this field. That also includes uh, infrastructures, but a lot of equipment and need gauge equipment. Now, what is driving? So as I was saying, we need to have, uh, we have aggressive roadmap in terms of technology line space, but it is also to cover a wide variety of dye uh, from low higher cons for wireless and connectivity, small package size, but also very large package size. So we will see later that the development on the additive manufacturing are able to fulfill the needs of already some of those devices, like the connectivity, uh, and the mobile and the aggressive roadmap of the computing, the FPGA, the processors and the memories that are driven by the, the, 
our um, laptops, our smartphones, and also data centers will be the next target, I think, for the additive manufacturing business. Here you will find on that slide um, the packaging technologies that we knew before 2019 um, and the one that we see coming. And what is very important to notice on this slide is the use of system in package that rely on substrate and the diversification of system in package. Um, so people are looking for multi die whether they are um, research institute, OEM and IDM, all of them are telling us we need multi die solutions. And um, this is a clear advantage because they have addressed to, they have to address the needs of heterocyst integration and also they are bringing to the developers a uh, faster time to market because they can reuse blocks. Now, where we stand in terms of uh, layer thickness and in terms of line space. So here you, you may see on the top right hand corner, so we have the board and PCB around 100, 100, uh, for copper and dielectric thickness topping 100. And if you look through the diagonal, actually, you will see that we are going to the IC substrate and the fan in, fan out. And we will see later that additive manufacturing can fulfill solutions to uh, the first uh, right part of this chart. Not meaning that there will be any solution in the future, but we are standing on the right part at the moment. Um, so just uh, this slide was actually to make a comparison because when we are talking to people, they always ask, okay, what do I get to change if I transition from traditional photolithography to direct printing? And actually the goal is to avoid the photo mask. I think that was said in the presentation earlier and to directly print, etch and strip um, the layers. Um, so avoiding the photo mask, actually, uh, me and my colleagues, we know that uh, the solutions, they have to find a break-even point when it comes to cost between the cost of the photo mask and the volume. So each solutions and for each type of dye, uh, we will have to find a break-even point for transitioning in terms of manufacturing. Now, if I go into the added value of the additive manufacturing for advanced packaging application. So as I was saying, actually we conducted a survey and for that survey, we had the chance to discuss with several business models. We discussed with R&D Institute, but also with IDMs, Fabless, Substrate Makers and OEMs. So that gives us a wide range of point of view on their capability and willingness to adopt new manufacturing capability. And the first added value that came was related to the flexibility and the scale of the VR and the line space. I will discuss later. The second one was also discussed previously. It's about the fact that they had embedded features, passives, cooling device, and multi-die. The third one is about the dielectric capability of um, having dielectric compatible with high frequency. The fourth added value is on the throughput. And the, four, the, sorry, the fifth is about electric, electrical roughness. Um, there is one thing that all those added values have in common is that they can be applied to the package like um, type flip chip, CSP, BGA, and system in package which are, we will see at the end, uh, the most important package of the advanced packaging industry. Now, if we go into detail on the added value uh, on the VI line space, so, um, so the line space is the distance between the traces and the VI pitches between two VIAs. Um, here I was saying, so now people are around 55 to 100, 100. And actually in the design, uh, the people we interview, they really like to get flexibility and cost-effective solutions to decrease those values. So uh, one of the added value that emerged was really the, the flexibility in designing uh, the features. The fact that when we, come, when we can make 3D features, it's even more interesting because in terms of design that gives us 3D features with small line space and um, small via pitch and flexibility in the design. Uh, the second added value uh, uh, is about embedding features 
Uh, so there are different type of embedded features. There are the passives that are already embedded, um, but we could now uh, embed cooling features and also multi-passives. So the, the fact that we can, the, the embedded die has been under development for many years for passives and actives. One of the added value of that package is to have a better thermal management, especially for power applications. And most of them were relying on cavity formation. So here in using additive manufacturing, there could be a better yield uh, in the z-axis. And especially because those type of package would em enable system in package, and that is now looked into more, uh, different type of markets. So here you have the list of the main markets, but it's true that embedding cooling and passives uh, fulfill a lot of needs. Um, so I was talking about the, the added value. Um, in terms of miniaturization, so it's already uh, processed, but uh, the number of players are limited because most of the players who have the capability nowadays are already substrate providers, and there could be more business models doing packaging that have interest in this. Um, also, to I think to reply to the question of someone who was here, actually, when we interconnect, uh, embedding uh, provides shorter interconnections and reduce parasite interference. So there were some uh, companies adopting this type of package for signal integrity, for connected devices, Wi-Fi, and GPS. Um, now on the Third added value, actually, uh, once again, the signal integrity actually for high frequency was mentioned. Uh, people want to decouple the signal and power. Uh, DK and DF are very important, and they, there is a lot of research for the package uh, on flip chip, based on flip chip. So it's true that most of the hand system units requiring this these new uh, developments are mainly for the 5G smartphones where we have seen a huge effort on materials for wearables and vestitions. So here you have uh, some uh, parameters that we have pointed out on DK and DF for frequencies above 6 gigahertz. And this is the roadmap for the, um, sorry, for, for the device developer. Uh, so beyond 5G, we know that there will be still um, a need for 5G to have more efficient DK materials, DK and DF. Now, the, the fourth added value actually uh, was um, production mapping in the sense that people, they want to get flexibility between low volume and high volume manufacturing. And the fact that they would avoid uh, doing the photo mask would give them some flexibility in the production mapping. So in a couple of examples of that. Um, so when people are developing uh, uh, sorry, package, they are working on the size of the board, number of layers, and most of the people told us that they need flexibility in design uh, for a very leading edge product to very low demanding product. Uh, so reduction in panel size uh, helps them to reduce the process time. And the two other key factors that came out was the FMT and the through hole. And uh, in some of them, what they say, specific component materials for, for area. So additive manufacturing were actually uh, helping selectively hide materials between layers, and that was seen as a kind of productivity advantage. And the fifth main added value that came actually was on the control of the roughness of the materials. Uh, very important when we go to very thin layers that was giving better performance uh, and a better um, power efficiency. So that's mainly for the market of telecom infrastructures. So that's for many base station and networking servers. Uh, but it was pointed out as a key element. So here you have um, the evolution of actually the attenuation per length by the frequency. So as we know, so for high frequency, uh, the roughness of the line is, is a key, and that was uh, an additional added value. 
Now, I wanted to share with you some uh, size, actually, of market, because uh, among the five ID value that we discussed, actually, a lot came around flip TBG and flip chip CSP. So you may have heard those years that uh, there were now a shortage of this package because of the substrate. It's among the, in the advanced packaging, that's among the most important package. And here you have the market, uh, sorry, you have the, yeah, the market reviews by market segment. So you would see that uh, a lot is going to mobile and consumer, but actually telecom and infrastructures with a high frequency is taking a large part of that. And now uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if I can help answering some questions, let me know. Thank you, Millie. We have time for questions. Okay. Uh, online, there was one question. Uh, what about the chiplets? Uh, they usually, some of them have dimensions which are bigger than the line and traces you talk here. Is that a definitely market for additive manufacturing or? So when we come to chiplet, there are different type of chiplet. There is the chiplet for the high performance computing where they split CPU, GPU. So, I mean, in terms of line space, additive manufacturing could target that as a second market in the future, but we need better demonstration, I think, in terms of line space. And especially because uh, copper, ink might be very important in terms of conductivity. But if people talk it, uh, chiplet in terms of system in package, where we have a die dealing with RF, another one with sensing, yes, that fits. That fits. That goes directly with the system in package that we were uh, seeing at the beginning. Okay, thank you. So, if no questions from the audience, thank you, Emily, and we'll move to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, we have uh, Oliver Reffel and Chris Bailey from uh, Frank Hofer IPA, who are going to talk to us about the Next Factory project, include, um, which is system and applications. Chris and Oliver. They're joining us on, online, so. Yes, it's uh, Chris Bailey here. Is, is Oliver there? Hello, Oliver, are you, are you there? So, we are ahead of time, so basically, maybe we'll take a few minutes break. Yes, I'm just sending uh, Oliver uh, 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 an email. I, I think he's not joined yet. So, but as you say, we are uh, a little early. Um, if you can uh, see if he can join us uh, a little bit earlier, that would be great. If not, we'll wait until the proper time, which um, was scheduled for uh, 2.50. Okay, let, let's just wait a couple of minutes. I'll try and get in touch with Oliver.
Hello, Oliver, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, Hi, we're, running, we're running a bit ahead of schedule, but... Uh, Oliver, please go ahead. So give, give, me, give me one second to, to adjust the... ...quality for you guys is better. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry um, that I uh, just dialed in in the last minute. So welcome, guys. I think it's uh, just the time to share my screen already, right? Yeah, go ahead. Just need to find uh, the, the right the right video to share. Okay, so guys, just please give me a feedback if you can see my screen already. Yes, go ahead. Great. So uh, I, I guess, Chris, you already used the time to, to, to introduce yourself a little bit. Uh, so welcome from, from my side as well. So I'll give a, a joint talk together with Chris Bailey. I would say Chris is the, the more important guy for this talk. So uh, he, he's, uh, so, to, so to say, at the end, like all important persons. Uh, and the title is Simulation-Driven Improvements of Hybrid Processes for Additively Manufactured Electronics. So actually, um, maybe some of you may remember that I already presented the last AME Academy uh, two examples of um, how electronic components or electronic functionality can be integrated into additively manufactured components. And I will pick up one of these examples, uh, actually just from an, let's say, overview uh, point of view before I hand over to Chris to present once more what we, what we did in the next factory project, what kind of process chain we developed actually to integrate electronic functionality into additively manufactured parts. And that's actually the point where I will hand over to Chris, uh, who uh, did the major work on all kinds of modeling and simulation work, which is actually necessary to orchestrate, to finally control and to mature these kind of process chains. Okay, by saying that, I uh, just want to to start um, right with a very, very short introduction to what we are doing at Fraunhofer Society, specifically at Fraunhofer IPA in the field of additive manufacturing. So for, I think most of you know uh, Fraunhofer Society, we are uh, the biggest German research organization dedicated to applied research. And Fraunhofer IPA is the Institute for Production and Automation Engineering. So we are located in Stuttgart and uh, uh, myself uh, is head of the department for additive manufacturing. So what we are actually doing in this field of additive manufacturing or what drives us is actually, uh, uh, we want to empower additive manufacturing for professional applications. That means we want to bring additive manufacturing to, to industrial. the industrial reality. So we do this cross industry, cross process and cross material. Um, so, and we're focusing on the entire process chain what you will also see in my talk right now or into this introduction. Um, and yeah, just uh, the, these, these quick words about us um, and what we're doing. And I want to start with the, the topic itself. Uh, to give a short motivation about 3D printing with electronic functionality. So I, I guess maybe uh, you, you heard uh, quite similar things in, 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 in the talks before, probably. Um, just to, to have at first a, a quick look on the day's potential of additive manufacturing to ask or to answer the question why additive manufacturing is becoming more and more popular. So as I said right now, so it, it is already a, a prototype manufacturing method and it's currently underway to really be accepted as a high value manufacturing method as well and specifically for very complex or individualized products. So all these uh, four examples on the top, starting from, from medical uh, tooth braces, uh, glasses, until high-end uh, aerospace applications or automation applications, all these things are actually already state of the art. 
And, and based on that, actually uh, novel business models and novel products, novel, novel ways of manufacturing individualized products um, is, became possible during the last years. And, and there's really a growing market, but at the moment, um, as soon as it comes to, to electronic functionality or, or to, uh, let's say, um, sensoric functionality, whatever you name it, actually then um, the, the game is over at the moment because there is no possibility to integrate these kinds of uh, functionality in, in, the, in the fashion of additive manufacturing. So this is, um, yeah, the, in, in a nutshell, actually the, the, the current limitation we, we actually wanted to, to overcome in, in this project I will present in the next slides to say, okay, all these limits regarding functional integration of um, electronic functionality, something we need to overcome to really mature this technology and to allow also this kind of uh, novel business model and novel products uh, when it comes to the integration of electronic functionality. So especially to, 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 to summarize this once more, uh, we're talking about industry 4.0. So in, in, in every product, in every component, there is a lot of electronic functionality. And so it's quite, quite a logic consequence really to empower AM technologies as well to make products with these kinds of functionalities directly integrated. And just looking at the opposite side, so um, th there are actually two ways um, to, let's say, integrate electronic functionality. So uh, taking the, ex the, the very famous example of hearing aids, uh, which are still already produced um, with an additive manufacturing method, you still have to have this, this manual assembly step um, to have uh, such kind of individualized micro hearing ads at the end. And of course, this is nothing that is really um, uh, possible to, to, to scale into, into uh, yeah, relevant industrial um, lot sizes. And on the opposite side, you have very, very long, uh, partially globalized process chains, uh, for example, uh, using uh, this, this, this cell phone. Um, so basically, of course, uh, if you need to ship it, if you have to, to, to have uh, different uh, production locations, individualization or even personalization might become a, a very tough job. So uh, both things are actually not uh, the right fit for, for, for the demands and for the, 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 the potential that you can, uh, you can get if you make the step to additive manufacturing and all these approaches probably or, or for sure not, not, not the right way to go to allow for this uh, individualization of um, uh, electronic functionality. So um, already uh, some, some years ago now, I think it's, 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 uh, it's about nine years when we started uh, thinking about uh, such kind of, let's say all in one manufacturing platform for system in package and micro mechatronic systems. So actually it was a, a project funded from the European Union. You see, you see all these logos um, underneath. Uh, we were the coordinator and uh, University of Greenwich, uh, where Chris is, is from, um, um, was, was part of it together with a lot of different companies from uh, process development until material development. Actually, just to, to give the background for what, what Chris will, um, will explain to you afterwards. So what, what was the, the vision of this system? Um, we said, okay, what we want to do is want to simplify the manufacturing of electronic and micro mechatronic products based on the principles of additive manufacturing. So that means you wanted to have a very simple system, input data and raw materials and get out the finished products. I mean, this is actually the magic about additive manufacturing to have this really, really simple step to, to get the product right from, from your data set. Actually, no tools, no ramp up and uh, the flexibility to have design freedom and lot size one. Actually, that, that was the vision and um, um, of course, the, the, let's say the consequence, what we derived from that was to say, okay, we want to develop, to develop a hybrid manufacturing process based on additive manufacturing and complementary processes that can be operated as simple as a conventional 3D printer. So we said, okay, oh, we, we, we can't make it with a 3D printer uh, on its own, but we want to have a process chain that is um, uh, from, from an outside point of view, acting the same way as a 3D printer. So 
can say there's a one-stop shop you produce in one place you have all production stages in one machine and you're able to customize the design and to have let's say only one supplier and only one contact uh, as kind of service provider if you want to uh, to to order such kind of product afterwards And the result from, from a machine perspective is what you see here. Actually, we developed this, this machine, which was uh, from the, the, the machine framework was done from company Uni Technologies. And we developed all these, uh, uh, these, these process modules internally, an inspection module that can uh, uh, get, get data, can gather data from each layer that we're printing, a curing module, which is in conjunction with this printing module, able to use inkjet printing with uh, silver conducting inks, as well as with dielectric inks to produce multi-material parts. And which is very important, this assembly module, which can uh, additionally dispense glues and can place discrete components like um, silicon dyes or uh, simple SMD components but we, that we can integrate this electronic functionality on the basis of these components and, and what, what what is very important to say um, all this is actually in the background orchestrated orchestrated by a modeling and simulation suit so that can gather the data from the inspection module and that can uh, forward and influence these um, uh, the results of the modeling and simulation part to these uh, three manufacturing modules at the end. And what you see on the on, on this bottom picture left is actually uh, some kind of test structure that uh, consists of several conducting tracks, um, as well as automatically um, mounted SMD components and also connected SMD components, which is integrated in this um, uh, printed PCB board. So, the orchestration of these four process modules um, that acts like one 3D printing process is based um, or the principle behind is that we have one manufacturing recipe which is run by a main PLC and we have standalone modules which have bespoke fun functionality and that have uh, let's say an integrated intelligence that allows to, to, to operate these modules um, on their own. So that means um, the overall PLC control just gives the right command to, to one of these modules. And then um, this module will um, have all the intelligence and all the, the components integrated uh, to, to do the right manufacturing step, for example, like printing a certain material, cure the material, or assemble a certain component. And as a result of this design, actually, there's a quite complex and extendable process chain that can be orchestrated based on very simple commands, which is included in these manufacturing recipes. Um, so, uh, of course, you need process specific data sets like uh, uh, pictures and the right, uh, the right coordinates to, to place components, but all that uh, can be uh, fed as one data set into the machine and you get out the final part. Um, so it follows actually the rationale of a 3D printer. Process sequence just uh, very quickly. Uh, we start with the printing of this kind of support material or dielectric material. Then you print, um, uh, for, for example, a cavity or you leave a cavity um, for your components. And then you can print the conducting track with a silver ink. You can place uh, the SMD component and then you can um, proceed uh, with the detection step to detect the, the cavity to place the component. Um, you can connect it with a dispense uh, profile or with a dispenser um, that connects to this uh, silver printed uh, part. And then um, you can measure the surface topography because for sure you have a certain distortion of your surface. It's not uh, perfectly flat anymore. Um, and then you can uh, go on with printing. Maybe you leave some holes open to dispense the wire afterwards. And in this step, actually, you have a layer-wise printing with an included assembly step um, uh, so that you're able to directly integrate uh, uh, um, electronics components or also complex micromechatronic components inside your additively manufactured parts. And by that, actually, of course, you can, you can drastically um, increase uh, the functionality of a 3D printed part. But the question which is, which is actually open, uh, now you have the, the process which still follows the idea of additive processes, but the overall complexity has drastically increased. 
And that means you need to find a strategy to still stabilize this process to um, to, 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 to take care of a stable process and, and let's, let's say the answer or part of the answer um, uh, will be given from Chris now because modeling and simulation, this is uh, clearly one outcome of our project, becomes the cornerstone to mature these kind of manufacturing approaches and to align of course with the demands of electronic manufacturing industry. And yeah, at this point, uh, I like to hand over to Chris to really touch on the what well, what what we put into the focus of this talk, the modeling and simulation, which is one uh, key uh, technology behind these kinds of hybrid processes to produce electronics. Chris, it's your stage. Excellent, thank you, uh, Olivia. Um, uh, can I share my screen, uh, Natalie? Can I share the screen? Or otherwise I can just continue clicking for you, Chris. Yeah, okay, let, let's do that. Um, uh, so thank you, uh, Oliver. Um, okay, uh, well, I, my name is Professor Chris Bailey. I'm based here at the University of Greenwich. Um, and so uh, we've been working with the electronics packaging industry uh, for the last 20, 20 plus years, in particular, uh, providing capabilities in multi-physics modeling, so electromagnetics, thermal and mechanical. Uh, and recently uh, uh, really investigating the benefits of combining those physics-based calculations with machine learning. Uh, capabilities. Um, and we use many of these calculations to undertake what we call physics of failure reliability assessments, as well as performance of manufacturing processes and thermal and mechanical performance, electromagnetic performance of electronic packages. But physics of failure reliability is, uh, is really used to, uh, with modeling to understand the potential root causes of failures in our package structures. This is leading towards the concept of digital twins uh, for the manufacturing process and for the actual product that's fabricated. I, I just like to highlight also this roadmap um, uh, that we're very involved in at Greenwich. Uh, this is the IEEE heterogeneous integration roadmap for advanced packaging and system in package uh, technologies. Um, this uh, roadmap contains 23 chapters uh, looking at applications, technologies, and two particular chapters that are very much based around modeling and simulation and design uh, that we're involved in. And, and also you'll find within these 23 chapters, there's a number of sections that are highlighting the benefits of AME. Uh, for advanced uh, packaging. Uh, next slide, please, Oliver. So modeling uh, approaches and uh, potential capabilities. Uh, if we think about modeling and simulation and how this can inform uh, the AME uh, processes, we can be using analytical models uh, where they are accurate. Uh, they're good because they're fast in, in their cap calculation capability. And then we have the whole area of mesh-based finite element type techniques where we'll be interested in predicting the way inks behave uh, from the nozzle and how they could be deposited onto a substrate and coalesce and cure and finally stress. Um, we can also use uh, what we call surrogate models, uh, which are based on the finer element calculations, but enable design space exploration, because there are many process parameters that we need to understand. Um, and modeling and simulation can help us understand process parameters and hence optimize the AME process for reliability of the final products. How can we embed machine learning capabilities and models in the AME process to ensure quality 
uh, of the final system. Next slide, please, Oliver. So, um, with regards to uh, the next factory project, uh, we had a number of tasks that we were interested in looking at here. If we think about uh, additive manufacturing from using CAD, computer-aided design, to then going into uh, slicing algorithms and then say G-code that actually would control the printer, how can we uh, inform this whole process through modeling and simulation. So you'll see the, the, the red circles here, which is very much about physics-based modeling, actually predicting uh, the different processes uh, in uh, the, uh, uh, the additive manufacturing process. And you can see some images on the right-hand side here of where models are being used to look at the way droplets behave. And also, layer by layer printing and the cure shrinkage that could occur there and also due to CTE mismatches we could get stresses uh, forming so understanding the process conditions and the way we layer each material uh, on top of another each other uh, using models to understand how to minimize deformation and stresses in these quite complex uh, structures. Uh, you'll also see here where, how we can undertake design space exploration uh, with regards to uh, sensitivity analysis. And then finally, once we have produced our fabricated parts, the, the sort of examples that Oliver was showing previously, how would these behave thermally and mechanically and also potentially uh, uh, with uh, regards electrical behavior. Uh, so these are the, the red circles uh, that we're looking at here on the, on the left-hand side of the screen. And I'd like to talk about that first before I come on to the machine learning and uh, uh, the condition-based monitoring uh, that we can build into the actual machine. Oliver, next slide, please. So uh, modeling uh, the inkjet process, uh, which is what we were doing here, uh, we were using a technique which is based on computational fluid dynamics, but in this example, it's a technique known as uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. And you can see examples here of how we're predicting uh, the flights and also how these uh, droplets would interact with the substrate. Um, and uh, how they would coalesce. Uh, so there's some examples here that you can see and uh, some, some comparisons here with uh, uh, the sort of drop watcher uh, type experimental techniques as well as some simple analytical calculations. Next slide, uh, please, Oliver. Uh, so once we've deposited uh, the inks um, which on a substrate or on other inks that have already been cured, we're very interested in understanding the cure process itself and the, the, the potential CTE mismatch uh, between conductive and non-conductive materials as we build up the layers uh, layer by layer. And this has been undertaken using a finer element uh, calculation and I, I won't go through this equation in detail, but essentially we are predicting, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, how each layer is behaving uh, thermally and mechanically as we build up the structure. Having tools like this enables us to uh, essentially get the process right first time uh, because we can change uh, uh, a number of process parameters here in terms of the cure behavior to ensure that the stresses and the deformation and roughness of surfaces uh, can be controlled. Uh, next slide, please, Oliver. Um, I, so here in this slide, we are looking at uh, uh, some test cases where we did these types of simulations. Uh, so remember, uh, we're looking at the deposition of the particles 
how they coalesce, how they form the lines and the structures, and then the cure process and the resulting stresses that, that come from that. Uh, but what you can see here is how we can undertake design space exploration in understanding the influence of, say, uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion of the material and how that, uh, uh, that could change or how that changes in that and comparing that with, say, the, the temperature change that we're seeing, how these uh, values can influence the final stress in the uh, in the deposited structures. Also uh, at the bottom here, you'll see uh, the normalized W, which is the uh, the width of the of the track, and how changes to that based on different temperature changes DT can affect the final stress in the deposited structure. So using modeling and simulation with accurate input data, so the materials data needs to be measured accurately, we can undertake these sort of design space explorations to understand what really influences stress and deformation in the printed structures over time. Next slide, please, Oliver. And here's an example of undertaking sensitivity analysis using uh, these uh, simulation tools. And what we can see here is uh, in particular, the, uh, the graph at the bottom uh, right-hand side of the slide, uh, the influence of the insulator CTE and how that small changes in that material property can influence the stresses that we see built up in, in the structure. Next slide, please, Oliver. The second theme that we had uh, within the Next Factory project was how could we build in intelligence through machine learning and the sort of some of the simulation character uh, calculations that we just saw above. How can this be built in uh, to add intelligence and smartness uh, to the 3D uh, printing uh, machine? Uh, so this was a, a, a software tool that we built to be implemented in the printer uh, for both offline and inline uh, condition-based monitoring of the 3D printing process. Next slide, please, Oliver. Uh, so uh, we can see here um, that this has been implemented. Uh, and uh, essentially we're using the, uh, what Oliver talked about earlier, the OPC uh, protocol for data communication and command communication uh, across the, of the, the printer. Uh, and essentially we're looking at uh, using uh, machine learning type algorithms, uh, state space algorithms uh, to learn uh, uh, from data that's being gathered it could be vision data or sensor data, temperature sensor data from the machine to learn uh, from that data with the models and then undertake predictions of how the printer and the quality of the printed parts would behave in the future, how things could change in the future. So in essence, what you're looking at here is uh, model predictive control. You can feed back these results to change the input uh, uh, parameters, process conditions for the actual 3D printer itself to ensure we keep the quality under control. Um, next slide, uh, please, Oliver. Uh, so process modeling using machine learning, as I just mentioned, there's, uh, there's a lot of things that we can measure inside a 3D printer with, uh, and this happened in the the next factory project with vision uh, uh, equipments and also sensors based around the uh, the the, pr uh, the the printer uh, to measure things like temperature and and, and other types of uh, parameters. Um, now, uh, monitoring these parameters, uh, you can use numerous types of machine learning algorithms. Uh, uh, neural networks is one example, but you'll see at the bottom of this slide, uh, uh, this, this graph here, where essentially you're using 
these uh, machine learning algorithms to understand what your target uh, trajectory is, i.e. the thickness, for example, of the printed tracks, uh, but then also having uh, sensing the data, say the temperature in the print head and, and other data that you could sense, and then controlling that to ensure uh, that you do meet those uh, trajectories uh, going forward. Uh, so it's having the modeling capability that the algorithms that can learn from the sense data um, in terms of the quality of the final printed structures, and then feeding these results back to the printer so that we get these optimal process conditions going forward. Next slide, please, Oliver. So here's an example. Um, uh, this was a, a, a test example where uh, we had, um, uh, you could see the, the, the graph at the bottom of the screen here, um, where measured data for a particular process run was undertaken. Temperature was changed uh, in the print head uh, to essentially control uh, the actual thickness uh, of the printed lines. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the, uh, in this case, is a state space model that was learning over time and then making predictions. And we could see here 25 steps ahead, 50 steps ahead and 100 steps ahead. And what we're seeing here, particularly with the uh, looking forward, say 25 steps or 25 lines tracks ahead uh, the, the the predictions of the model um, is, is quite good it's 92 percent accurate here in predicting what would happen in the future with the current process parameters but like i say with model-based uh, predictive control you can feed back these results to help change the process parameters if they need to be changed to ensure future quality as as the uh, as as the process is proceeding. Um, so, in in summary, um, modeling and simulation is uh, um, certainly seen as a key enabling technology uh, for AME, and um, uh, in both understanding the printing process itself and controlling that, and also ensuring that we meet the performance and reliability specifications of the 3D printed uh, structure. And it's a particularly exciting time, particularly with heterogeneous integration and system in package technologies um, where modeling and simulation uh, can support uh, developments in these areas. Uh, next slide, please, Oliver. Oliver, I hand it back to yourself. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Uh, actually, yeah, it's, uh, you, you could do this as well. So, so just the achievements that, that we had at the end of this next factory project was to have uh, these, uh, the, this, this hybrid process chain at hand as kind of, I would say, research platform, but which is also at the end or was at the end able to, to print these uh, kind of small PCB boards that actually, as you see here, uh, were able to withstand all these uh, kind of, uh, let's say, standard PCB test methods. And last not least, I think this is actually the, 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 the key message from this talk as well, behind all that and to mature these technologies, the modeling and simulation was developed to, uh, to, to that point where we have this as an additional tool to, to predict quality and to improve process stability and to, to improve uh, product quality um, for future products that are additively manufactured and that have electronic functionality included. Yeah, that's uh, actually um, ma major outcome. Maybe Chris, you want to add something? Um, uh, you know, I just just to say, uh, you know, there's a lot of capability in these uh, simulation and modeling tools. They are used extensively in the electronics industry. It is an exciting time uh, going forward with the capabilities of combining physics-based modeling with machine learning and moving towards what we call digital twins, 
Um, Oliver, you mentioned Industry 4.0. So there's a lot of data that's being gathered now in, in our systems. And uh, uh, one very important thing for, for modeling and simulation is the close linkage required with metrology. Uh, because you do need accurate materials data, and that needs to be measured to enable these types of tools uh, to really benefit AME processes. Yeah, so that's the end. So many thanks for listening. And if there are any questions open, feel free to get in touch with Chris or with me. So thank you very much for listening. Any questions from the audience? Yes, go ahead, over there. Uh, what is the size of the parts that you're able to make with your machine, the size? You mentioned the size of the parts. The question is, what is the size of the machine? So the, the, the size of the machine that, that we have shown is uh, about a uh, footprint of three and a half uh, by two meters. Just a second. And... No. Oh. Can you hear me? Okay. What is the side of the parts that you are able to make? Ah. What is the size of the parts that you were able to make? Okay, so the overall printed components, um, I think this is where your question refers to. Um, so we have a build space inside this machine, which is 100 by 100 millimeters. But uh, honestly, uh, in, in this project, our test structures were, were uh, some, uh, some centimeters smaller. So what you're seeing on the pictures is about 15 by, I guess, 25 millimeters in in edge length and it has a, a, a thickness of about two millimeters, but that can actually be increased. And actually this is currently uh, yeah, work in progress to, to let's say speed up the process so that we're also able to, to, to build parts with, uh, uh, that are larger actually. Okay, just to, uh, a question online that uh, probably goes up after this, a uh, good question from the audience. Uh, it was, um, did you do any correlation between the simulations and the actual printed devices? And if you did electrical measurements on those? Um, uh, no, we didn't do any electrical measurements. Um, uh, so there's no correlation there. Uh, we didn't have a chance to do that, but we did, uh, you saw in some of the, uh, uh, the figures I showed, we did uh, correlate with sort of uh, predictions for uh, the thickness of uh, line tracks that were printed and related those to the printhead process parameters. Uh, but we didn't compare with any electrical calculations. Um, we, we certainly would be very interested in doing that in the future. Okay, any other questions from the audience? If not, we're going to go to the next uh, presentation. which is entitled uh, Advanced Applications of AME Technologies by Andrea Salomon and Rolf Baltz from James. Check. Hello, everybody. Now I can proudly present our new funded joint venture between Hansoltz and Nano Dimension, a German-Israeli um, joint venture 50-50, uh, which leads to the James GmbH now jetting additively manufactured electronic sources. My name is Andrea Salomon. I welcome here at the Productronica, and I say welcome also to the um, visual audience. Um, we are standing for three-dimensional printed designs. We call it AME. You can find um, our uh, short letters in, in our name of the company. And here next to me, um, Dr. Rolf Baltes, a colleague of mine who takes care of 
the RF performance of our new AME design structures. Myself, I'm the one who takes care about the technical issue in form as a um, team CTO. Also from my side, a warm welcome to everybody. So for, for what does James stand for? We will establish a community platform which will get online in order to, to reach out what's possible um, with the three-dimensional printing technology also um, the Dragonfly offers. New functional designs with a new three-dimensional routing philosophy is that what we are preaching here. And we are building out also an in-house lab that makes us able to show you in proofs of concept what we are designing. We want to make some exercises together with you. We will invite you to our collaboration platform in order to contribute and help us to, to read out um, the new performances of this new uh, evolutional step beyond the PCB designs. So together, okay, hmm? here maybe you, you um, need some introduction what the, the Dragonfly stands for. Maybe you know we have a multi-chat printer. We have uh, two functional fluids. One fluid is the dielectrical ink and the other functional fluid is the silver nanoparticle ink. The silver nanoparticle in ink is getting sintered by an um, IR um, sintering process in a low temperature range. And um, our dielectrical ink, we will harden out by UV light in the nano dimension printer. Therefore, I have to um, um, add on that we um, are going ahead with nano dimension in order to reach out the Dragonfly 4 version which was verified and, and also checked um, during our alpha and beta verification campaign. We did here in Munich, in the Munich South in Taufkirchen. So we, we will later on um, see some special designs. Normally, you know, the PCB form factor that's, that is uh, even flat, uh, 2D, 2D plus, but let's go up in the set axis and into the third dimension. We have to use this degree of freedom and it's possible with this machine. And this is what is coming out. So the process we are working. One year ago, we processed also Gerber data, um, layout based and now we are very proud that, that we are um, doing the same um, um, CAD data processing than, uh, that you normally know from the um, AM world. Um, we are processing step files, STL files, but there is a little difference on it. We process um, for conductive ink an own step file and for the isolation ink another step file and the combination is getting out of the printer. So. We are using the slicing tool. Um, if you want to have a visit on the um, hall B2, you can uh, enter the nano dimension exhibition stand where also James is presenting um, our uh, special demonstrators. I show you here on this presentation. And yeah, one in a short explanation, we are doing voxeling. We have our uh, simulated designs, um, normally also RF simulated designs. We put it into the printer and, and that what's com coming out is verified and, and can be checked in case of a proof of concept. And is checked by environmental testing when it's needed and checked of performance. Yeah, this is what can coming out. This is really, for instance, a three-dimensional design. And um, this is a three-dimensional design, which um, what we can say, this you can't produce by a normal PCB production. One example from the civil world. 
So um, I told you we're coming from the Munich South, um, very close to the Airbus facility. Um, and, and so we have figured out an explanation. Um, the way we are thinking and, and the way what uh, will be possible if we are going ahead with this innovative technology. And here you see a LED bulb here as uh, the example from a, a cabin lighting from the, um, the plane, the A320. Everyone knows it. You have LED lights um, over your heads, but sometimes you see you um, not only th uh, three LEDs are flashing, maybe sometimes only one and, and two others are um, blind covered. And so this is, in our opinion, a loss of an electronic volume. And so when we switch to the next slide, we see, okay, we have a blind cover, but we have the um, electrical volume um, in, in form factor of a LED bulb. And is it possible to implement another application in this form factor of this LED bulb? Well, why not? Yeah, let's install a, a functionality for example, a Wi-Fi hotspot. What do we have to do for this? We have to squeeze an electronic function. Maybe you know it from the PCB style, a Wi-Fi hotspot, okay. And then we squeeze it. And what do we need for this? We, we need really a merge of an E-cut and an M-cut design tool world. And this leads to our identified USPs. And now I want to hand over to, to Rolf, who is waiting for this, and I will switch the slides. <laughs> okay, thank you for the introduction. And uh, yeah, as Andy already said, I'm going to talk a little about the USPs of the AME technology itself. So where do we see the big benefits of uh, using the AME technology, especially in contrast to, let's say, the classical PCB uh, stuff. Yeah, you already know. First of all, AME allows us to really go to more complex designs. So our goal is not to replace like a PCB by just printing the same in the AME technology. We don't think that's uh, any reasonable. What we want to do is we want to go beyond the normal PCB technology. So whenever there is some, some place or some point where traditional PCBs meet their limit, that's, in our opinion, the place where the AME technology can take over. So, for instance, just imagine you have an RF line. You want to go from a classical PCB from somewhere on the top to the bottom. You have somewhere in the between, you have to use a VIA. And for RF design, this is like yeah, a little like the living hell because you have to adapt it for all the frequency range you are covering. And you have to uh, yeah, add some capacities uh, to or some inductivity is to really get a reflectionless connection from one point to another through the VR. And imagine we have just the AME capabilities. You have to just draw a very smooth coax line from top to bottom, and you are there. So no more simulation required. You got a predefined bending radius, which should work. And afterwards, yeah, you just put it in there and you're done. So that's one of the benefits we see from really the, using the AME technology where the PCB technology is at its limits. Another big advantage of the AME is that we call it here the hybrid parts, meaning that whenever even the AME technology is still too weak, there are hundreds of other different 3D printing technologies or maybe even conventional technologies that has nothing to do with 3D printing, and we can just combine them. For instance, if our structures are too weak, mechanically speaking, then maybe we can just yeah, add some 3D printed metal parts and using like the, the fine uh, the fine parts of the AME technology with the high accuracy and then the more stable uh, 3D metal parts to give the whole thing a stabilization and combine the two advantages of both technologies. So and Rolf, this, this means that AME covers lots of more processes than one. Yeah, exactly. So, so we're speaking about everything in the 3D world which make us able to electrify volume and to make it stable and to make it to rise into a pro product story. Yeah, that's a very important point. So we are not limited to just one technology. In our field of AME, we want to use everything that's help that helps us. <clears throat> Another big advantage of, of our AME printer is that uh, the whole 
obsolescence management and also logistic and maintenance part will get uh, yeah we get to new levels i mean when you usually you have a, a pcb uh, structure and you want to replace it you need to have the exact same pcb available so meaning if you have a lot of big systems available you need a stock of uh, hundreds maybe thousands of different pcb just in case one of them breaks and you have to replace it now with the ame technology all you need is a printer and two bottles of ink and then you can just reproduce whatever part you need so you don't need to have a stock of yeah let's say a hundred or thousand pcbs you just reprint what you what is broken and you just replace it and imagine you have a digital database of your design and you can put it into the printer and print it out when you need it as well as the replacement of cuts components you have to procure here with this technology we will be able to, to cover also an electronic design of maybe coils, maybe capacitors, which can be imprint in the design. You don't have to procure anymore. Another good aspect of the AME technology is of course the eco-friendly and the sustainability. It's uh, getting more and more important in our world today that we are somewhere green and uh, I mean, what could be more green than just to replace all the acid and etching processes by just some additive part where you only need the material or only put the material where you actually need it. So there's no subtraction anymore, almost no waste. And uh, of course, you're, yeah, I think alone the, the imagination of the assets involved in the PCB projects will uh, make it clear that this new technology is much more eco-friendly than the old traditional PCB. Right, Rolf. We're speaking here from a, a tiny fab in a box. And I think the value of this box will increase over the years. There will be new functional ink available, which makes us able to, to put more functionalized value inside a product story and inside AME structures. So the first step is the sustainable, sustainable step. You can produce the amount of structures you need and this is i think the most sustainable factor also in this in this case so what what can james can do for you living the traditional way of pcb design Why? exactly <laughs> yeah i mean as <clears throat> with the with the new ame technology you have the freedom to really create your form factor you need so there's no need anymore to squeeze to squeeze this uh, yeah flat PCB form factor somehow in your functionalized uh, volume. I mean most most of the time you don't want to have an end product that's somehow flat and rectangular, but you will have uh, yeah other functionalities will be fulfilled by your yeah outer hull. And now with this AME technology, you can just fit the AME part in the system where you need it. So it's no need to just adapt your, your system somehow to the PCB or to, to include it somewhere there. You just print the PC or the AME structure in the form you need, maybe for some aerodynamic reasons, maybe for some other reasons, and you're good to go. So no, no more adapting of any form factor. You have somewhere in your system, you have a tiny hole left where you want to put some electronics in. Yeah, just, uh, just take a 3D scanner, uh, characterize the volume. We need to fill with some electronics and you're good to go. Just design it in this form factor, include the components, and you have even in the tiniest hole, you can include some electronics. And this was not possible with the PCB technology because it was always flat. Rolf, one question into the, the PCB world. What does a wire drill and a metallicized wire drill means for a high frequency signal? coming out from an RF SOC application or a high data rate signal. You know, the data rate will increase. It won't get any lower. But what does a wire drill from the conventional PCB design means to this signal? Uh, for, for an RF signal, this wire drill is like a big disturbance. I mean, you are coming probably from some microstrip line, you're going down with some vias, and in the middle, you will change to a three plate line or a strip line, whatever. And of course, these are like three different uh, modes of propagation, and you have to adapt your, your line to each of these modes so that uh, in the end you won't end up with uh, all reflective, but that you really get your signal through the line. And that's a very, yeah, somehow you can handle it, but it will take a lot of time, a lot of simulation time, 
And why not just use an AME structure, which provides you with a just coaxial line, and you just draw the coaxial line where you need it, and you're done. It's so this uh, like means a couple of weeks of uh, simulation versus uh, five minutes of just implementing the coax line you already know. This means what we are saying is get rid of wires and leave the PCB traditional way because it meets their limits. Exactly. And it's not only like the RF designs that is want to get rid of the vias. It's not only the reflection you get there, but also the space that the vias require. I mean, usually uh, the vias are added at the end of the PCB manufacturing process to save some money. So this also means that when you have a via, it's going from top to bottom all over the place. Meaning if you want just a connection from layer one to layer two, also the place underneath layer two will be blocked by the via, although it's not necessary electrically. You don't need a connection over there. Basically, you could just draw some other lines over there if you would have the space, but you haven't because the via is going through the whole structure. So, so this is another point why we... Sorry. So it's much more easier for you to, to um, see on this picture. We show you here the transformation from a PCB form factor and rooting philosophy to our amified structure. It's even flat, but it's full 3D. And now you can see on the right side what we mean. Rolf, yeah. can you explain it a bit? Of course. So basically what you see here is on the left, on the right side, it's like the same structure from top on bo and bottom. So you can assemble the same components on it. But on the left side, you see the PCB version of it. You see here on red, the wires, and you see the yeah, two-dimensional lines going there and the landing pads. And here on the right side, you see like exactly the same top surface, but the structure has to be amified, meaning that now you have here a, like a tube system. You have a very smooth transitions from one pad to another. So there, for RF designs, this is uh, much better than having these uh, rectangular yeah, things all over the place. So this means you can dive with the wiring direct down from the electrified pad into the AME structure, which makes it even smoother for the RF signal to get covered, to get shielded, and to get routed very direct on the direct ray by three-dimensional routing to the place where it has to be routed. And it's also be able to coaxial line this wiring. You can twist a pair, you can implement helixes on it. And I said to you also, it's possible to implement capacitance by printing and uh, implement coils, which make it much more uh, transparent when you completely um, RF simulate and, and um, Signal integrity simulation uh, are implemented um, to, to grant that it's much more um, improved than in the traditional way. Do you have in between some questions? Then, then you can raise your head. No, then we can go ahead. And this can be much more even 3D. Now we uh, show you here the transformation from a electronic functionality of a synthesizer, an RF generating application, PLL, phase lock loop, to an AME structure here in, in the form factor of, of a cube. Maybe you can exactly. show us some details. Yeah, sure. And if you're interested to see those uh, designs in live and printed, then you're more than welcome to join us at our booth at uh, Hall B2 at the Nano Dimension booth. There you will even be able to, to see and touch the finished uh, products over here. So what we did, we started on the left side with a traditional PCB. As Andreas already said, it has a PLL functionality generating yeah, an RF signal. And we said, okay, we want to get rid of this flat form factor. So we started transforming the whole stuff into the cube you see here in the center. It has the same functionality. They are the same landing pads for the same components. Of course, the programming would also be like the same. And uh, the only difference is like the overall form factor. So instead of being flat and small, it's now like a cube, not only giving it a more compact design, but also in terms of mechanical stability, this cube is much more stable than like this flat uh, PCB, which is always a little problematic if uh, vibrations get too harsh. So with this completely embedded components, it's uh, yeah, 
much more stable and even vibrations uh, are not that much of an issue anymore. Maybe it's easier to understand when we are talking about a new form factor of a new building block concept, which you can integrate in the system architecture. So let's talk about our James portfolio. We did some exercises. We, we are working since 2016 together with Nano Dimension. Um, in this time, um, um, I was taking care of the second European um, beta machine of the Dragonfly system, and it was quite impressive. We collected massive experiences and this we want to share with you in our collaboration network and so we figured out in the last years um, yeah, our portfolio where we see strong effects and strong benefits the one thing is in the rf frequency application where you can see oh hey this this um, yeah, structures are also not flat anymore yeah the next thing is, you have seen it, the slide before, our um, cube form factor for RF generating um, function. Um, this is an integration example for active and passive electronics. At the moment, from the evolution to a PCB up to, to a, a stack cube, then to a completely printed cube with a pick and place of the active components inside. This is our actual status quo. So therefore you are also invited if you have ideas and, and you want to join us to, to give us your experience. The next thing is the antenna field. And, and this is a, a good thing is get rid of material. You know? um, if you don't use it, if it um, costs, um, um, or um, reduces your performance, then leave it away. And so you can see here also in, in radiation element designs, um, this is the possible way to get rid of material um, in order to enhance the bandwidth of antenna structure. And last thing is, yeah, we can individualize and make um, hardware layer, hardware security application by individualized packaging of chips. And in the last year, we made here our first experiences together with our colleagues from the production in Ulm from Hensold site. And they figured out with us the implementation of a Hensold Cyber um, MMIC with more than 300 bond wires in an individual rooted three-dimensional uh, packaging um, in the form factor of a CPGA um, ceramic package. What we did, uh, did, I can show you a slice later, was really impressive. So we have also some specials and basics because we are able to do something. And this is a form factor. I think every one of you knows this the form factor of a drone frame. But what you see here on the left side is completely, completely printed. That's the reason why we not populated this. This is completely printed. Printed with the Dragonfly and printed with the FDM Ultimaker. This is the work of high value working students in our house. And we are very proud of it that, that they really have the fire to use the new technology and to, to rise it to, to another level. And this is the combination, the mixture of a printed motor, the combination of our own designed motor regulator and, and the combination of our own designed um, yeah, flight controller. Um, the only thing I can't show you yet is, yeah, we can't make it fly. It's, too weak at the moment, but I can promise you it's getting stronger. The more 3D we will rise. On the right side, Rolf, if you want yeah. to. Sure. On the right side, you see our James coin. You may ask, okay, what's, what's the James coin about? No, we are not starting doing uh, cryptocurrency or something like that. It's basically one of our easy entrance stores we want to present on our platform. It's meant to just uh, yeah, get all the community that is interested in AME together 
and uh, give them some easy entrance to to get in touch with the with the whole technology especially here with the ame we have the requirement let's say to to get the, the electrical engineers to do some mechanical stuff and the mechanical engineers to do some electrical stuff and therefore we uh, we thought about this this easy entrance story, which involves some yeah, mechanical designs, involves some NFC techs, so some easy electronic circuits, and uh, later on combines both of them so that anybody who really is going through the story on our platform will be able to, yeah, to join the AME community and knows how to, to do his own steps in this environment. Okay, now let's let's go a little, let's dive a little deeper into the technology. We're going basically again through our portfolio, this time a little deeper. And uh, yeah, what we what we see here, we start with the radio frequency applications. Of course, as we originally come from Hensoldt, uh, RF is like the yeah the first thing we thought about. And uh, what you see here is yeah really three dimensionally printed coax lines. So basically here you can just attach the coax connector and yeah, go on on the AME structure within the coax regime. So you don't need to switch to, uh, let's say some, some micro strip or something else you, you would have to do in a traditional PCB process, but you can just stay on the, on the coax mode. Of course, uh, at some point, we also reached like the limits of the, the printing height of the AME printer. And of course, this uh, yeah, this was not good enough for us, so we wanted to go even higher. And in order not to yeah, get into trouble with our process, we thought about how could we get some RF signal from one AME structure to the next one. So the idea was basically stacking. So and that's when we designed here on the right hand side. You see it a little. You see like the coax line going there on top is then it's cut and uh, goes on in the upper part. And with this structure, we were able really to get RF signals from one AME structure to the next one without even needing some sort of connector. So, so we can also speak about the combination of a conventional PCB with our um, three-dimensional AME concepts. If you can imagine, then the flat structure on, on um, the bottom side is a conventional PCB, then, then we can overprint or can attach our three-dimensional form factor on top of it. In, in order to, to rise performance. Yeah, and, and this is also a test verification structure um, Rolf designed. We, we put the verified RF design into our synthesizer RF cube, just for your information. Exactly, so now let's talk a little about, again, the comparison of the AME technology with other RF materials. So for instance, we took here on the right side, you see on top this blue curve. This is a conventional microstrip line and a conventional process on Mectron 7, which is one of the RF high performance materials. And for us internally, this was like a little the goal. We want to go at least as good, we want to be at least as good as the conventional Mectron 7 in order to use it really in an RF process. So we started here on the left-hand side, you see the blue curve, and you see, okay, according to the losses, there's still a lot to do. So uh, this was our starting point in 2019 uh, when when we um, entered by by uh, buying a Dragonfly 2020. Exactly. So this was one like one of the first measurements we did uh, with the Dragonfly structures, and as you can see here in the in the legend, it, we had like three percent of the copper conductivity. So the conductivity was not really comparable to, yeah, to a standard process. And also, yeah, the, the losses were also way too high. So we tried to figure out what we could do at this point. And the first thing was, okay, let's try to improve like yeah, the conductivity. So we tried a little bit post-processing and how to improve the Sinter process during and after the print. And suddenly we ended up okay with 30% of copper conductivity. Still not like 100%, but uh, still much better than the 3%. And when we repeated like the measurements, we ended up with the red line. So we also projected like the red line here on the on the right hand side to compare it with the Mectron 7. And we saw okay, better, but still not good enough. What else can we do? And it wasn't hard to figure out that okay, 
Now the biggest part of the losses are no longer from the from the conductivity, but it was the dielectric material. I mean, we have a, a loss tangent of 0 0.02. And since we are no chemists and we had no idea how to improve this one, our only hope was maybe we can just remove it from the electromagnetic field. So we started to use really the three-dimensional design uh, possibilities we had. And we just removed like the dielectric material and the region where the electromagnetic field is located. So what we did, we printed two parts, one with the cavity, the other with the microstrip line. We put the microstrip line on top of the cavity and suddenly most of our electromagnetic field was no longer in the dielectric material, but it was guided in air. And air being yeah, almost lossless was a good thing. So after some measurements, we ended up here at the yellow line. And so you see so much performance increase is covered by using the third dimension. Yeah? It's, it's by leaving the traditional way of thinking and, and routing. This is a massive improvement you can figure out if you do it in the unconventional three-dimensional way for electrifying structures. So I, I will switch to the next slide. And here you see what we also mean. It can be even flat, but also in flat structures, it can be rooted in a three-dimensional way, as you see. Exactly. So here on the left-hand side, you see just some, some kind of test coupon. As you see, of course, the surface is completely flat. So it's, uh, yeah, if you could not look through the DI, it could also be some sort of PCB, but it isn't. So it was designed to be just a test coupon for capacities and, and coils. And what you can see very good here on the left hand side, we have these traditional air coils. We can just print them in our structure. So making them very reproducible. So you don't have to this, this manual wiring process or something like that. With this, you can reproduce them and they are yeah, working quite well. Also with capacitors, we have them here in a, in a flat form or also in a, yeah, here on the, in the center in a round form. And compared to the traditional PCB process, of course, uh, you can stack a lot of uh, different layers for the capacitor. I mean, if you, want, if you imagine you want to uh, create a 70 layer capacitor in PCB technology, you would need like 70 layer PCB, which is yeah, almost uh, too expensive to pay at all. So this is one of the advantages where we think, okay, in the passive components, we should and we must print them directly with the AME technology. And uh, yeah. I think we're getting very good results over there. Switching from like the, the passive components to the active components. This is an issue, we can't print them. So we don't have any semiconductor ink or whatever processes ready yet. So basically if it comes to chips or transistors or whatever, we are still yeah, forced to buy them and to include them somehow in our structure. What do I mean by somehow? Of course the yeah, most obvious process would be just to solder them like in a standard uh, process. That's what we, what we did here. So you see, we, we just put them here on top of it. Afterwards, we covered them so that they would be uh, included within, the, within our AME structure. But really our, our actual goal is to really put the pick and place process within the printer so that we don't have any additional steps so that the completely part populated, embedded with the components comes out directly of, of the printer so that we only end up with one production step. So no population outside, put it back in the printer and continue printing again, but no, we want to have it in one process step. So you see, in addition of printing a structure, we also have to take care of the population pick and place process as well. Now this makes this structure we printed functional, otherwise no function at all. So we have to take care about it. The active elements have to be implemented but later on, I tell, ask you the question, is it needed to use COTS housed components later on when we are ready? Maybe we can handle the chips. And here, active and passive electronics additional example. This is um, our exercise we're doing with our synthesizer form factor. Here you see a completely thicker printed um, cavity it's not the, the ready cube, it's just the population area where we implemented um, a PLL component inside and, and, and a game block. And you see 
um, we implemented also coaxial um, lines, which we have rooted here inside of this. So this is really, really a three-dimensional design. And, and we exercised um, here a soldering process. We are using a professional vapor phase um, 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 soldering. You see our, our um, interconnects here, they are ending here because the way goes up. Yeah? There are two additional population areas we need. The, the next steps will be to implement um, here um, um, a covering um, um, pick and place installation area. And then later on, we have to fill the cavity in order to print above it, above it and go on with the printer and stack the active components. Yes, for sure. We have to take care about hotspots. We have to take about to get heat out, but we have a silver nanoparticle ink, which is also be able to transport very well heat. And you can imagine we have a three dimensional form factor. Um, why it isn't possible to implement some heat transportation pipe inside of a cube. So maybe an answer uh, when you see this picture. On the right hand side, it's a conventional PCB design where you see why we're talking about to get rid of wires. Cause here is a DDR4 module, um, 20 layer based um, design. This is original reprinted design. And um, therefore, we, we had the problematic field, so special design uh, inside. We had to print 60 micron thick lines. Ooh, it's very hard. Yeah? But we exercised it and, and checked it out um, if we figure it out to, to manage this. Now you know the Dragonfly 4 is able to print 75 micron thick lines. And yeah, this is below the, the actual design rules. But we, we have been in discussion with the layouters and the designers, and therefore we said, or we found out, yeah, why are the design rules of such an um, signal integrity design is so hard? Do you really have to implement 60 microns lines? And then we got the answer, oh, we have, so many wires in this design, we have not even a space to implement the functionality in this form factor we are ordered to. Um, we have to put the function inside, we have to use um, the reduced thickness of this line. And so get rid of the wires and we will have enough space to print it. And this will be the next steps also um, on our agenda. So, Another thing, just for short, I um, uh, spoke about it. Um, let's um, put new form factors in, in antenna and radiation element designs. This is um, using um, um, more performance by getting rid of um, lost tangent material where we don't need it. And here is our chip housing concept. We had a situation in last year that we wanted to order conventional ceramic package from Japan. And in case of COVID, we, yeah, we had to wait quite a year for these packages. In this time, we had a problematic field in our project. And then we said, okay, we have to, to practice, we have to force it. And then we started to go ahead um, um, to produce our own packaging. And then we identified that we can individualize it and protect this packaging form factor um, really, really good. And we had our experts and technology scientists from, from our production on our side, which helped us to figure out how to bond on printed structures with three-dimensional wiring. And I can sell, uh, tell you there is nothing, really nothing flat in this design, nothing. You can zoom in and then you will get deeply impressed. Um, we figured it out in the last year to implement more than 300 bond wires on it. And uh, we checked it out. The, we made that board that is completely printed as well as the the conventional board design, including um, our, we called it interposer, but now it's not an interposer anymore, it's an individualized package. 
And here you see also it's um, uh, a handsold cyber chip on it uh, with greetings to our colleagues from handsold cyber. Um, the MIG-5 um, system on chip is here implemented um, and it takes care of um, IT security with the RISC-5 um, architecture on it. Yeah, and we forced it. We had a risk five production problematic point and we forced it and, and we succeed, we made it running. And so we could implement here um, some hardware uh, side attacks, some threats from industry spionage. And I can promise you we had, um, we found some solution where we make it really problematic to, to come to, to this chip by this house. So to the basic and specials, I can show you here um, just some insights. I can even invite you to visit our exhibition stand in Hall B2, the nano dimension stand with James Covered. And there you see our running v mode running drone. Yeah, and here you see our printed motor. It's as well a high value design from a working student. And this is impressive. The next thing is Rolf already talked about it. Rolf, if you want to introduce our easy entrance coin story. Sure. Well, yeah, I already talked about the, the James coin as we call it. And this is like just a uh, yeah, um, little yeah, more advanced design view on it. As you can see, we wanted to integrate an uh, NFC tech functionality. So of course, the first step was just to buy an NFC tech you can uh, buy on Amazon and just uh, stick it on it. It already worked perfectly fine, but that's definitely not, uh, not the goal we want to achieve. We want to print the whole thing in, in AME. And we do not only want to print it in AME, but we also want to embed all the components that we can't print inside the structure itself. And this here is like a, yeah, a schematic view of a 3D model that will show you uh, how we finally uh, did this. So these, these kind of wall thingies you see over there, these half round uh, balls are actually a capacitor. We have, of course, you see like the coil on the bottom of it and uh, yeah, the green thing you see uh, shining through the whole stuff. It's like an, an LED indicating that the NFC signal got some, some contact. We have also some diodes there and of course the NFC chip itself. And one of our basic application ideas for this was yeah, maybe we can use it as a, like a business card. So you don't no longer need to distribute your paper business cards all over the place. You just uh, attach something like that, maybe to your keychain or something, and you save like all your business card information on it. Your counterpart on the trade show just uh, takes the cell phone out, holds it against your yeah, James coin and got all your information already saved in the cell phone. Maybe it yeah, helped to save some paper. Yes, you sure. <laughs> so we are working in a tiny lab. Three weeks ago, we installed it. Yeah, it's it's a container now, because we are waiting at the moment to move inside uh, of a bigger hall where we go indoor. But now we are tackling it, and we will uh, print during the whole winter time. It will be impressive. Um, so um, then we can uh, talk about our experience. To, to print in field. <laughs> and yeah, we installed here um, inside of the container the, the Dragonfly 4 system. I told you we, we entered also the alpha and beta campaign together with Nano Dimension to figure out the release uh, of the unveiling yesterday. We are very proud of it. And yeah, I, I told you also we are a German Israeli company, 50-50%. And this is quite also um, for us a highlight. We are working together for years. Um, it's, it's a really good um, yeah, well-being, uh, being um, teamwork together with the Israel colleagues here. And, and we are quite in, uh, good in touch. And this was the reason why I, our Hensold headquarters and also the, the uh, yeah, Bavarian ministry um, gave us the, the chance to um, yeah, to open up our tiny lab. Yes, last week we, we have been five persons. Our CEO, Andreas Müller, myself, Rolf, you know now, 
our working student Pascal and our uh, working student Karis Höft. And now we have an additional person we were welcomed on Monday, um, um, Jasmine Morales. She is um, also here available in Hall B2. If you want to get to know her, then you can see um, our new colleague. And yeah, here we go. Um, I say thank you. Um, if you want you. to have some visual insights, I have two additional videos for you. Yeah, so um, um, maybe you can sit and I open up here um, two additional videos. I um, showed you um, our synthesizer and here this is an inside view of, of the, the routing of our synthesizer, um, what's inside. And so you can have a closer look on it, you know, how we manage the three-dimensional routing. This is by hand, whoa, fucking hell. And he's the designer. That was some, some sort of work. Yeah. <laughs> and here you see the coaxial lines. And um, we are zooming in. And um, the next step, is we make a cross-section on it. And then you can see the coaxial um, imprinted uh, um, line inside of the coax. Yeah. This is very unconventional rooted. We, we decided to, to um, make this design in order to show you something which, which is really unconventional, yes, to be honest. Also new shapes of ground, ground layer, not even a ground layer. This is ground where we need it. And here you see the coaxial line. And you see that we are going up into the set dimension. The population areas is to take respect, um, also to have the possibility to, to implement the pick and place of the active components. Yes, it's sure we have to take care about it. We have not at the moment the degree of freedom to do everything in, in a special shaped way. No. In one case, we have to be flat. The next photo uh, uh, on video is here uh, with contribution to, to our customer partner, um, the VWeb Institute from the German army. We have the uh, yeah, allowance to show you this um, micro CT cross-section video of our cube. And I say thank you on this side i can play it later on in addition and then you see yes we we realized it this is real you can have it in hand if you see our um, exhibition stand in hall b2 what you also see is we have um, uh, also the ability to put labeling inside um, so a good thing to to ensure that it's your design The um, height of this um, structure is 10 millimeters. So, and for those who don't expect that it's working, I can show you it's working. This is an evolutional step before Rolf told you that we implemented a stacking module, a stacking cube, which um, also um, handled by us. And here you see the three-dimensional form factor for the interconnect um, applications. Yes, to be honest, sometimes it's not only 3D printed, sometimes we have to um, yeah, implement some wirings in addition. But yes, it was radiating and it was working. And, and now the race is on to put more function into three-dimensional AME structures. Thank you, Andrea Salomon, Rolf Baltes. We Thank are you. James. You're highly welcome to enter to our collaboration tool. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, what are you using? <clears throat> as your starting plate structure for adding your layers. 
because it's I think it's impo uh, important for rigidity after you make high frequency uh, applications. Uh, well, the, we we just print print everything from scratch, so there's not not like a starting structure or something like that. We we just start printing with the polymer and then add the the uh, yeah, silver part to it. So, so it's not like we're printing on top of something already existing, but we built the whole thing. We built it up from scratch. So we are starting with an empty tray, nothing on it. Yeah, it's a structure where we build up. This is the base plate. Yeah. And, and then we build up the complete structure um, during printing. Yes, we build on top. This is additive manufacture. You rise higher. Yeah. Oh, you mean what, what's like, okay, we, we, we usually have a tray in the printer that's moving and on top of this tray we, we put some, some Kapton foil and on top of this Kapton foil the whole structure is built up and afterwards we yeah, remove the, the 3D printed structure and yeah, throw the Kapton away. And remove the, the electrified structure away. Yes, thank you. So, I excuse me. Hello. Hi. Hi, thanks for presentation. Uh, two questions. One is how do you deal with the layers? Because you mentioned that you achieve uh, 75 micron layers. So I assume when you print structures that are angled or bent, you would have steps. How do these steps affect performance? But first of all, these, these steps are, yeah, they're not so big. So for, for instance, the the thickness of one of the silver layers or structures is around 0 0.5 microns or 0 0.4 even. So yes, of course, there, there are some kind of steps, but uh, they're not so high that you would affect any performance. Okay, clear. And uh, second one about the thermal performance. You mentioned that uh, you deal with hotspots by using highly conductive uh, polymer with uh, silver quite, uh, as well. So, Question is, once you have your components embedded inside of your PCB, uh, printed PCB structure, how do you dissipate the heat away? Well, actually, this is like a, an, an active field of research. We have a couple of ideas. Uh, I mean, for instance, you could just imprint like also some sort of heat pipes or uh, heat, very good heat contacting structures. I mean, when you can yeah, embed and imprint some, yeah, some, some chips, why not embed also some cooling structures? Other way, yeah, would be like uh, maybe at some point Nano Dimension will release some kind of graphene ink that yes, then you can already print your structures completely within the process. Yeah, that's, these are just, that's, let's say, the starting ideas. We haven't had the time yet to really look into this, but uh, yeah, we will definitely do so in the near future. So you have really different points of focus where you can find a solution. Yeah, for example, additional inks. Yeah, with a higher thermal conductivity. Also, additive manufacturing offers other solution. Maybe you know that in bare metal, also copper cooling structures are really in tiny form factors are available now. Yeah. Why not to use it yeah, and cover an AME structure around it? Yes, okay. For instance, it's not a total printed story, but it's a, it's a really good and hot um, um, integration story you know, to, to put value in the application and put the heat out, maybe in a heat pipe printed with bare metal cover. So just to summarize, you're saying uh, you think it's going to be possible to 3D print heat pipes? Why not? I'm looking forward to that. I think everything <laughs> is allowed in AME and AME covers so many fields where we can be active. And this is also a message to, to you all. Yeah, we have so many points of focus. You're expert in this different fields, maybe from optronics, maybe from military applications, maybe from civil applications in, in high end with high signal data rate. Everyone has their own use cases and their own environmental condition. And this is the way to, to reach out the AME in, in, 
yeah, in the range of a product. So we have to qualify it. We have, we have to fulfill normings and standards. This is the thing that the normal PCB structure have inside. They had um, enough time to grow more than 50 years of evolution. But now we see that there is a limitation when data rate is increasing, when RF performance is increasing, when an RF SOC meets a normal conventional PCB and you see, oh, the signal is whoa, not so good coming out and the high value RF SOC, I spent more than 10,000 euros for it, can't show its performance because of the PCB, which is high value and then expensive. Okay, any more questions? Okay, if not, we'll, we'll thank you very much. Thank you, Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think I need to cancel the next talk. Thank you. I think I need to cancel the next talk after this one. Uh, okay, the next presentation, we're going to go over the, from design to test and integrated approach and solutions for AMI device and circuits. Uh, and I would like to thank actually also the, uh, the James presentation as well as the one from Frank Hofer, because they have given a great intro, uh, introduction for what we are going to be seeing now in what is available and what's coming in, in the near future as well. So I'm going to go to a brief uh, review of the company, uh, what we're doing with some uh, of the technologies we have acquired, the industry roadmap and AME applications. Um, Dragonfly 4 is a product that we introduced this week. Uh, and uh, we'll address there, for example, how do we achieve the resolution that uh, some of the questions that were raised before. And then we'll talk about the flight suite of solutions from the design to fabrication of AME devices, which is the thing that is enabling to go basically 3D and integrate the eCAD and the mechanical CAD. So in the look at the product overview, the company uh, started in the 2013, and the first product was uh, shipped uh, to the market actually in around 2018. And we grew from there from different versions from the Pro to the LDM, it stands for Light, light uh, Digital Manufacturing, Lights Out digital, digital Manufacturing, then we have an improvement on that. And uh, this week we introduced the Dragonfly 4, uh, which also requires basically the flight su uh, suite of software for operation. But we are also implementing artificial intelligence. And I think the, the presentation that uh, was given uh, before actually talks to this, but this is a heavy program and it's a program that we're focused in nano dimension to bring the artificial intelligence and the deep learning into the additive manufacturing for electronics, where we take into account not only the machine and the properties of the materials and the design, but also we take into account the testing performance and bring it the feedback into the overall operation of the system, but aggregate that between multiple systems in the cloud and enable the management of a fleet of, of a printers to perform to the best of the performance to the particular design that has been implemented or has been planned for. And basically the concept is as going from the traditional PCB manufacturing of electronics into a new process which is simpler, faster, and more user-friendly as well as environmentally friendly. And therefore, because of these, the capabilities and the sizes, you can basically distribute your manufacturing. So you can have the design in one center and produce it in the different locations that the, the company has and distribute that and be basically also on-demand delivery. So with this, let's go to the AME applications from DC to RF. We have seen some of them earlier today, like the RF from uh, Dr. Yang, but we'll see some others uh, now. And this also worked from uh, Hensel that did in the early days. Uh, it's already outperformed by what we saw today, but we see the capabilities from a regular type of electronic circuit to an any shape circuit to uh, basically the motors. And uh, we saw them before already implemented in the previous presentation. On a, on a drone design. But here's another example um, by Rihau. We're basically taking a 3D design with cavities and embed LEDs as well as a touch sensor 
that allows you to select the color and then detaching around the, the LEDs, you select the intensity of the light that this the particular device is controlling. But we can, because of the additive manufacturing, we can build uh, coils, we can build uh, the interconnects and all that in a single board and keep, keep the, the cavity in place. This is an example of a design just to demonstrate this capability on a five volts to 20 volts uh, step up uh, transformer with two concentric coils and basically the functional of this. But having been able to, to do base a, a cavity like that and the coils, you can also imagine that now you can create also ferrite type of a, a transformers where you create the cavity and the coils uh, are in the area and then you insert a, certain uh, ferrites that correspond to the size of what the, the device has been built. In this case, we have been characterizing the E5 and E14.5 type of coils. And we can see here some of the performance uh, of these results, which are relatively new, where basically we look at the inductance as function of the frequency and uh, different uh, turns from six to 24. And we see basically a very nice and flat performance on this inductance. Now, so far, these were designed based on ECAD. Uh, sorry, the coils were designed based on mechanical CAD here. Uh, and the question is, how do you integrate that with the rest of the electronic design? And we'll see now the tools that will be able to do that as well as after we go through some of these applications. Others are the ability to create a structure where basically you integrate vertically your ICs and reduce the, space, the distance between them. So the interconnects are basically between a very short space and uh, in the, essentially there are no vias here. It's just the connection from one uh, contact to the other one directly. The part of the design of the functionality required here, and then the IOs are on the top. Now you can uh, basically create the uh, structures where the contacts are in the side and you use this as a unique feature on a motherboard to create certain uh, customized functionality. Or embed components as we saw basically in the previous slide as well. But capacitors is one of the features that can be done here quite effectively. And uh, this particular case is 55 layer capacitor. Uh, we can see, we will see some more details on this uh, structure, but then you can start creating the low pass filters and band pass filters as we saw in the presentation from Dr. Yang earlier today. You can see here the X-ray, the cross section of these uh, capacitors and the connection through the stats all the way to the transmission line. So let's start looking at the capacitors, for example, of these printed uh, structures, a part of a circuit as well. Uh, in this particular case, it uses the same dielectric as the rest of the board. It has a dielectric constant of around 2.78, and therefore that allows you a reasonable capacitance between a couple of picofarads to about three uh, nanofarads, but very important is that the consistency of the, of the capacitance, it, the variation basically over thousands of prints is less than 1.5%. Leakage current, well, basically we didn't measure, we wrote less than one pico one because we just couldn't see it. But also the breakdown voltage is very high, it's over one kilovolt. But very important is the temperature stability factor uh, shown here, which we measure it to be about an order of magnitude better than the best ceramic SMT capacitors in the market from a Japanese uh, factory. And that reflects also what we see on the Q factor, where if we compare the Q factor for these uh, AME capacitors compared to the standard in the industry of SMT ceramic capacitors, we can see the Q factor being stable with frequency compared to the Q factor for the SMT capacitors. Furthermore, if we look at the impedance performance, of these capacitors in the commercial uh, ceramic capacitors, we can see that the degradation of the impedance starts increasing and crosses the, the minus 25 uh, dB around uh, one, one and a half gigahertz. And if we look at the AME, capaci the AME capacitors, we can see that it stays in this particular case all the way to three gigahertz uh, at the level of uh, less than 25 dB. So, it has a, about a factor of three better stability on the impedance as function of frequency, which therefore improves the performance on the design of the circuit altogether. And having said that, why is that? 
So if we compare here the equivalent circuit and the mesh, the components of the equivalent circuit for the AME capacitor as compared to the, the capacitor in a in the in the commercial SMT capacitor, we can see basically that, for example, look at the R1, we have a 0.1 ohm in the AME capacitor compared to four ohms in the commercial. If we look at the inductance also, we have a 0.05 compared to a 0.32 and so on all, all along. So all the parasitics are at least one order of magnitude lower altogether. And that's basically what enables this thing or the performance that we have seen. So an AME capacitor behaves almost like an ideal capacitor. So if we look at the two capacitors, C1 and C2, they basically, you, you add them, you get the actual value of the capacitor that has been designed here. So this simplifies altogether the design that you are planning to, and that's why we see the RF performance that we saw as an effect in here. So the question with this is, okay, so what do we do with that? So we need to integrate that into the ECAT systems, and we see later on how we do that. Now let's look at the AME LPF low pass filter. In this particular case is one designed for a five gigahertz cutoff frequency. And what we can see here is that there is no shield in this implementation. It's just the low pass filter uh, printed and uh, measured and uh, it stops, uh, basically cuts the frequency, the transmission around five gigahertz. Important thing is to see that that transmission remains below 30 dBs all the way to 20 gigahertz, which was a limiting temp a frequency measurement due to the equipment that we had in this particular time. But being the capability of the 3D design as well, in the MCAD, we can also build in a, a shield within the structure. And that's an important factor to take into account because now we can design the shield according to the, the path that we want to control as well with this uh, low pass filter or we can decide also to make sure that the, there is no external radiation affecting the signal here. And if we comp look at the performance there, we can see a very good agreement between the simulation and the actual uh, measurement where we see the cutoff frequency at five gigahertz, but then at 15 gigahertz, it goes back up and that has to do with the resonance related to the, to the shielding. Similarly, we can do it with a, a, a design where we compare AME cutoff design at 2.4 gigahertz and replacing the AME capacitors by off-the-shelf ceramic capacitors for the same value. So we can say first that the, of course, the cutoff frequency is lower now, it's around uh, 3.8 to, to, to 2 instead of the 2.4 gigahertz. But then after 6 gigahertz, the implementation with the SMT capacitors, it stops, which that's a consequence of the parasitics of the soldering, of the mounting basically, as well as the casing of, the, of these capacitors. So let's compare now and overall the performance between AME and off-the-shelf uh, low-pass filters. And um, for example, we can look here at the couple that in general, the bandwidth of the AME is wider than the case of commercial ones. And if we could look in some situation here, for example, this uh, commercial uh, with the similar bandwidth of 11.5 to the AME of 12.5, and they have several performance on all the other aspects, we can see here that the weight difference is tremendous. We are talking about a kilogram compared to an 80 grams. And it's likewise in some, some of the other cases. And this is because of the structure is all embedded and is naturally designed there to be light. So this is a feature that is actually very important for the commercial applications, especially sat the micro and nano satellites that are being designed. Now let's look at another application, a high speed data communications, which is necessary for autonomous cars, where you want to communicate basically as fast as possible the signal from the car and other for the camera and other sensors into the computer that is uh, doing the analysis and response to that. So the ideal case here is to use uh, the the T bias the bias T circuitry and how you make it uh, effective to to perform this. And the ideal here is in this area to design that with 3D coil. So basically, 3D coil with there are no vias at all. It's just a spiral there that requires a design in 3D CAD. 
And here we see the results. In the right-hand side, you can see the, the design, which is done with VIAS in a ECAD system. And the left-hand side, you see the 3D design we've done in the 3D CAD. So it's very clear to see that we have a continuous spiral in the 3D CAD compared to the, the ECAD. But for the same cross-section, uh, the area cross-section of these uh, two designs, we see that the inductance is uh, higher for the, the, the 3D versus the VIA uh, design case. The, the DC resistance is uh, slightly lower, but the normalized Q factor is, uh, we can see there is, is much better. And the impact on the transmission line in the case of the 3D is less than 2 dBs compared to the over 9 dBs for the, the VIA case. And this is just prior to even further, further optimization. But the importance here is that if we design these elements in the 3D CAD, we need to bring also the electronics in place to take advantage of elim el elimination of cable connections as well as uh, uh, parasitics that could, ha could happen in that case. So what the industry is looking, and we have seen some of the ex example now with the work for the presented by James, if we go from this uh, type of integration of the devices on a, on a, that uh, brings the proximity of these uh, structures also going vertically integrated, could be anything from five to 15, maybe it's only 20 or 10, but this is the direction where eventually you will have all the processor, the memory, the RF and the antenna in one package, all very solid and consolidated there, improving the overall performance and basically staying, enabling the continuation of the Moore's law. So let's look now at the AME fabrication. What is it and what has changed? We introduced the Dragonfly 4 this week, uh, where we have basically improved the performance of the two materials, the dielectric as well as the conductive material. We bring, bring to the field now a 75 micron traces. Uh, right now it's a 100 micron spacing and uh, not to distance will also do, go to the space there. A 150 micron vias, a 150 micron ball page, which basically makes it compatible with the mainstream performance in the industry. Um, we also improve the quality of the print. Uh, we improve the thickness variation to less than 5%. It's about a 50% reduction of what we used to be and a highly predictable uh, conductivity of 30% plus minus 5%. So uh, I think this is just covered previously if we skip in given time, but here you can see some example of a plated through hole in your right hand side or vias and uh, traces, uh, which are basically very solid and straight on this uh, performance, uh, looking at this cross section, but also improve the quality of the print. Uh, we eliminated the uh, sources of uh, defects that could come from other parts of the, of the process and uh, improve altogether the yield. Here you have some other cross sections uh, where you can see some micro vias as well as traces, uh, all uh, manufacturing very nice and solid uh, performance. Here you can see basically what we talk about the 30% plus minus 5% on uh, repeating the conductivity of these uh, traces and uh, the stability. And we focus basically on ensuring a statistically value performance of the manufacturing that we enable to do here uh, for this process. And uh, basically for comparing the Dragonfly uh, uh, by, so, sorry, it was a Dragonfly 4 there, a 2 versus the 4 plus 5. We can see here basically that the, in the Dragonfly 4 and the flight software, we are doing effective rendering. And this is an important factor that enables the 75 microns is the rendering and the, uh, that, that is used for that. And then the ability to basically control the pixelization, the, where do you place this line in the, in the process because uh, for some of you who attended yesterday morning, we explained uh, yesterday afternoon, we explained that the positioning can, can shift the, the width of the trace if you are not within the pixelization that is designed. So that's what another improvement that happened here because prior to that, we have a situation where you design 75 microns, but in some places came out close to 90 microns. So that's also a problem that has been uh, resolved and, and put in place. 
the fly suite is solutions from design to fabrication. Let's see what it is. And basically you can realize that this is some of the things that enable what uh, James presented before with the PLL. So basically it's a, a way to streamline the AME process and a holistic approach to bring the design, the engineering and the printing. So we'll start for example, the fact that we need to have design rules in place so that the design that the electrical engineer does corresponds to what can be printed, produced, fabricated in the, in the system. But this is quite a task to do it manually. So we have automated that and part of this comes into the overall uh, family of uh, software that con it constitutes the, the flight uh, software suite coming from the design, with, which includes the flight check that enables the, ab the ability to bring the, the design rules into the ECAD applications and the flight plan that basically enables this is for the first time a, re an, a regular integration basically or transfer from an ECA design into a mechanical 3D design. And we'll see some more details on that later on. Then we have the pre-production or uh, of the flight control, which for those who are familiar with the PCB manufacturing is equivalent to the CAM, but it's all in internally here into the system. And then the operating system of the Dragonfly, which has the improvement to be able to control the, the rendering that is done in the pre-product in the flight control. So in this flight software suite, how it operates, basically we have the ECAD and we bring the flight check, which basically is a rule-based design validation that reduces any design errors. And that basically is being integrated or uploaded into the ECAD system. And then the designer can use based on the, his methodology. Some of them basically applied right now, real time during the design. Some others do it at the end after the design, but the flexibility is there. The important thing is to integrate it into the ECAD. In the, from the print flow point of view from here, if you design that this is just a, an ECAD design, you can go directly to the flight control where basically you uh, generate the job and they go to the printer. If we want to then do an integration with 3D CAD, we use the flight plan, which basically consists of plugins that get in, uh, installed in the ECAD and the mechanical 3D CAD. And this is done so that the design engineers continue working in their known environment. So do you need to create a new environment, a new interface? And basically when you have your 3D CAD, you basically transfer it, uh, your ECAD to the 3D CAD. And the design is such that as you are doing the integration and optimization of this design, if you need to take your ECAD, your ECAD component and re-optimize it or change something because as you integrate it, you decided that there is something else that needs to be changed there, you can send it back to your ECAD, okay? And then back to your the ECAD for final integration, or you can do that as many times as necessary and then basically send it to print. We're using all for this, all these standards in the industry for communication on the standards between ECAD to the flight control or as you go into the 3D MCAD all the way to the using STLs to the 3D printer. So in the flight check rule-based design, as we said, the, you take the import of an existing standard ECAD into our flight check, you validate automatically and correct any variations that have relative to what we have in the flight check, then you import that modify to the ECAD. We today, what we have released this week is the support for Altium and Cadence Allegro. And in the roadmap, we are going to release a mentor expedition and also Zook and R8000. So let's see how this thing works. Basically here is when you start in the Altium, you download the, their, the design rule checker file that you have, that they have in there. Then you go and check uh, the designs and again, the rules in the flight check. Then you basically take all the corrections that you may need to do there if necessary. The system will go, go through that and confirm them.
some cases you may need to do, it may indicate if the manual upload is required because maybe some of the features may be in conflict or not properly defined in the design rule. So you, it allows you to do that manual adjustment. And then basically you do a check and confirms what, is, what has been fixed, what remains as it was, and then you can upload it back into, in this case, to Altium and continue with do do your design or do the final corrections if necessary accordingly. Similarly for the Cadence Allegro, this is, will, you will see now an accelerated uh, demo of the same thing, but works in a similar way, but then it uses the, the uniqueness of what Allegro uh, has for respect to the, the design rule checker that they have there. There are variations from CAD implementation to CAD implementation. So we have taken care of that to make sure that it's a seamless user experience for the designer. But you can see that basically the, the application, the interface of the checker is the same in that, in that sense on the correction and adjustments is this, it works the same way. The only difference comes then when you upload the file and you confirm then there are some different factors that the Cadence Allegro uses different than the, than the Altium in this case. And you will find the same things with the, the Mentor exp expedition as well as with the Zuken. And then here you complete this, the Cadence spe Allegro specific uh, requirements once you, once you upload the file back into their, into their unit. Okay, now the flight plan where we integrate the CAD and 3D CAD, uh, co collaboration, as we said, enable the conversion of a 2D or 2.5D from the ECAD into a 3D CAD. And basically it's a plugin, as we said, that sits on the Altium or SOLIDWORKS, that was the first introduction we did. In the roadmap from ECAD, we have the Cadence Allegro, the Mentor Expedition, and Zuken. And from the MCAD, the, the next plans are with NX and CATIA, and eventually we'll bring some others on, on, the, on the plan as well. But basically here, the workflow is you export, as we mentioned before, the electrical design from the ECAD into the 3D mechanical CAD, you make the adjustments there, edit, modify, if necessary, send back and back and forth and then send to print. So here is the, how this thing works. You're looking at the design, in this case of electronic design from the Altium, and it's going to be exported now uh, to go into the, into the mechanical CAD. So it's saved in the designer computer as a specific file. And now you go, for example, in this case to SOLIDWORKS, you upload that file and you start importing layer by layer. So each layer here is represented as a mechanical component in SOLIDWORKS. And this is what's happening right now is bringing the different layers into place, but you basically operate in SOLIDWORKS as it was any other mechanical element in there. Or if you want, if, if, for example, you cannot design a coil, as we said before, effective coil in, a, in, the, in, the, in the Altiums or the, basically the ECAD. Now we are going to see how you basically incorporate into this ECAD design a coil that comes from the 3D mechanical CAD. So what is defined here is the length of the coil and you know, the diameter of the coil. And now it's just going to basically insert it. And here it is. So this is the previous electronic design now, including a 3D mechanical design integrated all together. And in this case, ready for print. So basically just to illustrate, you can have here, for example, a 13 layer ECAD design, and then you can look at layer by layer do the inspection in the 3D and decide basically you need to connect to a, a, an in-between layer. It's, this is a capability enabled altogether by doing this type of integration. Because for example, in the previous case, you can decide that 
instead of connecting on the on the top or in the bottom, you can want to connect right in the middle because that's the functionality you, ne you need in supporting basically what we saw before from James. So let's see how the, the, flat, the flight plan can help us optimize uh, PCBs. How, what, what can you do when you take a PCB that has been used as PCB or in the hopefully very soon start designing that from a PCB, make it the AME capabilities you can bring to solve certain problems and reduce size and improve the effectiveness of that design. So this is actually a commercial available board today. Uh, that has been uh, is a product of uh, Semicron uh, here in uh, Germany, and is part of a DC motor controller circuitry. So as such, the top uh, right corner of that is the area of the I/O for the current, and because it's that you have resistors there to cut down the the voltage as you go into the board, and you basically, as a consequence of that, you have a potential of creepage as an example. So what has been done here also to make it lighter is design a board like this, okay? Where basically in the middle, you can see the areas that basically reduce the weight altogether and both in vertical and, uh, and horizontal and basically create a structure that you don't need the rest of the material at no cost because this is naturally printed simultaneously. The other factor here is very important here with respect to the creepage area, where by adding these vertical walls around the different, the three areas of potential creepage, but keeping consistent with the IPC 6664 standards on the distance between two points in the creepage. So basically the size was reduced by 50%, but the distance was remained consistent with the standard by going vertical, okay? So this is quite a unique way of making things smaller, lighter, and stay in compliance with the IPC standards required for electrical performance. In this case, the safety of creepage. Another thing that was done here is the creation of these elevated structures or recess structures in the mounting for the EMC, as well as the overall mounting of the board in the overall structure they were doing here. And this has to do with the behavior that they, is used sometimes with the tools that you use to mount the boards on the final product. The tools can slip from the, for example, if it's a screw, it can slip and therefore damage the finish of the product, damage the traces. In this case, these walls will make sure that if, if the tool slips, it remains confined and doesn't create a damage. So this is basically what uh, the, in this case, uh, uh, Michael Schlecher from uh, Semicron has been thinking on how to do these things to basically simplify the designs make it more effective, lighter, as well as manufacturing a way to reduce the, the waste that they have on boards when they get damaged during assembly. I have what, that board here in my hands if somebody wants to see it afterwards. So now the flight control. The flight control takes care of the basically the cam or the pre-production uh, and a, a setting of the job to print. Um, and it basically creates the overall workflow and supports simultaneously 2D prints as well as 3D prints. So you can do both of them regardless of the thickness of them or the, or the height. So let's see here an example of that in operation. Uh, basically it's going to be selecting the, the files that you want to print and it's just doing the rendering right now, place it there and then you can uh, manipulate it and uh, do some 3D adjustments in there if necessary. And then uh, move it into place and step and repeat it if that's what the requirement is. Basically, the requirement is to print three of these. It will, you step and repeat it in place and just set it, sets it there. And then you can add yet another complete different part could be a 3D, the cube, for example, that we saw before, but also allows you to do the stack up and the bias analysis and, and make sure that everything is in line, in light with what is required to be printed. Okay, so how this, thing, how this technology is being now used for several uh, activities, 
uh, with uh, different customers. Uh, for example, this is a, a conventional design for a satellite communication board where we have the communication single processing, the RF amplifier strip line, and then the connection to the antenna. And by the use of the AME technology, basically what we can do here is create the clocks in there and do the same thing. But now it's all in one single board, no additional assembly required. And uh, you can see here the features of being able to even do it, burn a, a turn 90 degrees up in this case, even shield it. Okay. However, there are other concepts that have been uh, considered or actually implemented as uh, eliminate the elimination completely of this uh, coax cable by being able to have the proper ground design, the antenna in one side of the board and the electronics in the other side with the proper connection in between. And actually this, there is a board like that right now in the International Space Station exposed to the uh, space looking at analysis, how the UV radiation as well as the atomic oxygen in space could affect the electronics of AME in space. And this is the work that has been done to this public knowledge has been done with a uh, cooperation with L3 Harris and uh, Space Florida. And we are waiting for this board to come back in about two months and then we will do the analysis. So as we saw, uh, the guys who saw the presentation uh, from uh, Michael Schleicher yesterday, and uh, things that uh, also Hensel was talking about, direct connections and all that uh, between uh, chips and uh, different structures that are being now enabled by this integration. And also the, basically you can create uh, twisted uh, wires. And here you can, you can see basically an example of a printed in this case, a triple twist, twisted wire. Uh, I cannot disclose the application exactly for this because it's from a, a customer that allows us to show this, but not exactly what has been done with that. But this is the capabilities that basically the integration between ECAD and mechanical CAD will enable now to create unique solutions uh, for the multiple challenges that we have, even from cyberspace security, all the way to being effective with the integration of components and increase the speed of the response to the devices. And we saw this before, but basically it's a summary of the original PLL board the how they slice into three elements integrated into what looks in principle like a maybe a refinery but it's actually an AME with no vias and all just a, a series of quarks and direct uh, contact, uh, wiring from a point to point so in summary the fly suite of applications enables the ecad and the 3d mechanical CAD integrations and uh, we can say that basically the limit here is the imagination of the designers and nothing and the capabilities of the fabrication equipment so as more fabrication capabilities are enabled more different designs can be made but i think james explained that very clearly that they can basically start doing almost anything so with this i would like to thank you for your attention and open for questions thank you Okay, so no questions, I'll, uh, just a second. I'll thank everybody for the attention and I thank you again, uh, Productronica for allowing us to have this uh, two-day seminar because uh, we are trying to basically bring the attention of what AME can do because uh, the industry is telling us that this is the direction to go. We saw that from the presentation from Yola as well, that they see where this thing can affect and improve the performance altogether and stay in, light, in line with uh, Moore's law. Thank you.